Dazai is a depressed middle-aged man with nothing to look forward to in life, so he gives up and decides to end it all. On a cold rainy day, Daze and his lover are seen walking together without an umbrella until they arrive at a clearing, the raging river. This is exactly what Daze was hoping for since the rain made the river strong enough to sweep a person away, and right now, he wants to be that person. He and Sakin came here today because they are sick of this world and plan Iskai themselves by drowning in the river Kun together. This way, they will be able to keep their promise to always be together, so before they jump in, they tie their arms together in solidarity. However, as we all know, there is only one true king of Isekai, and he isn't going to let his job get stolen. So despite them being in the middle of the forest, Truck Kun shows up out of nowhere to take them out before River Kun does, even if it doesn't make much sense. In the next moment, Dazai wakes up in a cathedral, and as he gets up, he is greatly confused by everything he sees around him, but he just assumes this must be the world people get sent to after they die. The style is different from what he's used to, but he will get used to it eventually. Just then, a voice calls out to him and explains to Daze that he has been summoned here as the hero of this world. The woman's name is Annette, and she says she is tasked with guiding those who end up here. To prove that this is indeed another world, she directs him to look out this window as a dragon and various other mythical creatures are seen roaming around in the world of Zauberberg. She tells Daze that he is destined to become the hero of this world and restore the light, but he doesn't seem too happy about it. He wanted one thing, and that was to die alongside his lover Sakin. But not only did he end up in a fantasy adventure instead, Sakin isn't even here with him. So he feels like he has broken his promise to die with her. Oh well, that just means he has to try dying again. So Dazai chugs an entire bottle of pills and patiently waits for the sweet embrace of death by overdose. Annette freaks out after seeing Dazai poison himself. So she immediately begins using magic to detoxify his body. But as Dazai regains consciousness, he tells her to stop trying to save him because it's really inconvenient. She doesn't listen to him and asks Dazai to stand up so he can fulfill his mission as this world's savior. However, Dazai doesn't even want to save himself, much less a random world that he just ended up in. He never asked to end up here in the first place, but this surprises Annette, so she asks if he happened to get hit by a truck. Dazai recalls a brief encounter with a truck, so Annette explains that she hired truck coming to isekai people here as part of the service she offers. The way it works is simple. Truck Kun finds someone who is depressed or deeply unhappy with their life, which is why he usually camps outside League of Legends tournaments. But after he has run over his target, they get sent to this world and get a second chance to live a happy life, and they usually end up feeling better. The fact that Dazai got run over means he must have been really unhappy with his life, so she doesn't see why he wouldn't be excited for a second chance. While she may be right about Dazai's old life being miserable, it doesn't mean he is going to be any happier in this world. In fact, he is pretty pissed that Annette and her isekai service ruined what was meant to be the perfect conclusion to his story. All he wanted was to spend his last moments of life with his lover, but she had to go and ruin it for him. Annette can't believe Dazai is so upset with her, but she's not worried about it since he will surely change his opinion once he gets to see his awesome stats. However, as she opens the stat window, she is shocked to see that Dazai possesses abysmally low health and mana. In fact, his health is so low that he would probably die from a stiff breeze in his current state. Annette refuses to believe Dazai is so weak, so she checks to see if he has some kind of broken ability to balance out his weak stats. But as she opens his ability window, she finds out that Dazai has no skills at all aside from depression level 5. Dazai is basically a glass cannon but with no cannonballs, so Annette doesn't know what to do with him since something like this has never happened before. Dazai decides to leave the cathedral since there's nothing left for him here, but Anna feels the need to make up for her mistake, so she grabs Daze's hand and apologizes for having him brought to this world since he wasn't meant to come here. She unfortunately doesn't have the power to send him back to Earth, but she can't let him go and live by himself either since he wouldn't last 10 minutes outside with his current stat points. Daze isn't surprised to learn that he's incredibly weak since no matter where he goes, he has always been a failure. Annette apologizes once more for her mistake and pleads with Dazai to stay in the cathedral for the time being since it's not safe for him to go outside. With his current stats, he would just end up getting snatched by a dragon or something, so she thinks it's in his best interest to wait before he does anything dangerous. Dazai thanks her for worrying about him, but he says her concern isn't needed since he is just looking for a place to die. Hearing him say this leads Annette to think that he may actually be different from all the others. When she first took this job, she was genuinely excited to guide the summoned heroes on their journeys, but since most of them were depressed league players, they were so annoying to be around that she ended up hating her job. Her tasks can basically devolve into ego-stroking the heroes to get them to accept the mission, but it's different with Dazai. As he is about to walk out, Annette drops her staff and chases after Daze, 
pleading with him to at least pick a profession before he leaves, but Daze turns to her and says there's no need for that since he is a natural-born writer, and that's all he will ever be. With that, he closes the door behind himself and says goodbye to Annette. And once Dazai is gone, Annette falls to the floor and begins thinking about how Dazai is the exact kind of person she has been waiting for. Meanwhile, Dazai has made it to some planes outside and is trying to get directions from a sign, but he doesn't understand a single word on it, so he just goes back to popping pills. Just then, he hears a voice saying he has just spotted a landmark, so five points of experience have been awarded. He may just be high off the pills, but he could swear that sound just came from his head, and it really hurts since he suffers from migraines, so he tries to get it to stop. However, celebration music goes off in his head as he has now gone up to level 2, and the resulting migraines make him want to die even more. Just then, he hears a girl screaming for help nearby, so he turns around and sees the girl getting assaulted by a deaf tree. She notices Daze and asks him to help her since she'll be killed by the tree if she doesn't escape soon, and the tree seems to be wrapping her in its branches more and more by the second. Daze just stands there as the tree fondles the girl and he seems to be enjoying the show. So much so that he asks her if she's okay about him writing a novel about this later, but the girl doesn't care about any novels and just wants Daze to rescue her already. To his credit, Daze gives it his best shot, but he can't reach her at all, so he just gives up. So the tree grabs him by the neck and hangs him up next to the girl. There's nothing he can do about it now, so Daze just introduces himself to the girl while he's hanging and says they are probably not going to last much longer. The girl blames Daze for their predicament since he couldn't do anything to stop the deaf tree. And now that they have been captured, the deaf tree is going to use its suction ability to suck out all the nutrition from their bodies, so in the next few minutes they are guaranteed to be dead. Daze says he's happy to hear that, but this freaks the girl out because what kind of lunatic would want to die by getting himself sucked dry? As Daze starts feeling weak, he looks like he's about to bust before suddenly slumping over. The girl starts to panic thinking Daze has actually died, but moments later, the branch that was strangling Daze begins to wither away, and the death tree ends up being destroyed because of it. The girl and Daze are freed as the tree disintegrates, but Daze is disappointed that he failed to die again. Thanks to his inadvertent victory, Daze levels up again, and the girl is left confused and amazed because she believes Daze intentionally made the death tree die by absorbing the poison in his body, but she also finds it weird that Daze would poison himself to begin with. She thanks Daze for saving her, while also apologizing for calling him useless earlier, but he doesn't think he did anything special. All he managed to do was fail to die, and he isn't happy about it in the slightest. The girl doesn't understand why Dazai is depressed, but he saved her life, so she sincerely wants to thank him. She suddenly has an idea and invites Dazai to come over to her house so she can express her gratitude properly, and Dazai sees no issue with this. So as the girl extends her hand and asks what she should call him, he says she can call him Sensei. However, as he grabs her hand, he is reminded of Sakshin. And that gets him to wonder if she might have ended up in this world as well, and if that's the case, then he might be able to find and reunite with his love. He has finally found a reason to stay alive in this world, so he will make sure he finds Sakshin no matter where he is in the world, and when he does, they'll finally be able to die together. His motives may be questionable, but at least he's not actively trying to die anymore. With that said, he has no idea where to even start looking, so he heads back to Annette's cathedral and Annette is overjoyed that he decided to come back to her, so she can finally shoot her shot. However, as the cat girl shows up behind Sensei, Annette freezes in shock because she hadn't thought Sensei would find a woman so soon after going outside for the first time. He says he has a question to ask Annette, so she prepares herself, thinking he wants to ask about her. But Sensei says he wants to find a girl named Sakin, so he was hoping Annette might have some information on that. Annette is disappointed that Sensei is asking about another woman, but she doesn't have any good clues about where Sakshin might be, so Sensei is back to the drawing board. Since he has nowhere to go, he follows the cat girl to her house. The girl tells Sensei to cheer up since there is still plenty of time for him to find Sakshin. But since her house is still pretty far away, she suggests they should stop at the castle town of Roth so they can take a break. She then holds his hand so that she can lead him there, however, Annette is also here for some reason, and she won't stand for such unholy behavior while they are out in public. The cat girl yells at Annette for smacking her hand over something as trivial as hand holding, and while she's on the topic of yelling at her, she questions why Annette is here in the first place, since it's not normal for a clergy to feel the need to abandon her post and follow people all the way out here. Annette doesn't really want to explain herself, but from the way she's looking at Sensei, the cat girl can already tell that she's in love with him. Annette denies having such impure intentions and claims that she is just here to watch over the weak otherworlder that she mistakenly summoned. As soon as the cat girl realizes that Sensei is from another world, 
She finally understands why he was so strong back when he saved her. Anna doesn't believe what the cat girl says since she saw Sensei's stats personally, and she knows for a fact that he is weakling. The cat girl still asserts that Sensei must be strong since he was able to defeat a death tree and save her life in the process, but this is terrible news for Anna since Sensei saving the cat girl's life is the first step to developing a romance. She can't believe she's already losing her chance to cat girl, but while they've been bickering this whole time, Sensei found something really interesting. It's a coffin that's the perfect size for him, so he climbs inside and says he has been feeling dizzy ever since he came here so he's going to take a nap for a while and they should wake him up when they get to the Tao. After that, he says goodnight to Annette and the cat girl, but the cat girl is mad that he still isn't calling her by her name, so Annette jokes that Sensei likes her more because he can actually remember her name. After that, Annette cheerfully ties a rope to the coffin Sensei is sleeping in and begins dragging it away. The cat girl asks if Anna should really be doing all this since she is supposed to be a clergy person at the cathedral, but Anna is too busy trying to pull the coffin until the rope eventually snaps. As they continue walking, cat girl gets tired of having to drive the coffin around, so she asks Sensei to get out and walk on his own two feet. However, there is no response, so she starts worrying that Sensei might have actually died somehow. Annette checks his stats, and Sensei seems to be fine, so he must just be asleep. They are pretty close to the castle anyway, so Anna asks Cat Girl to just bear with it for a little longer so they don't have to wake him up. Meanwhile, inside the coffin, Sensei is peacefully dreaming about his beloved Saction, and no matter where she is, he will make sure he finds her so they can both die together. But a while later, they finally arrive at the castle town of Roth, so Anna and Cat Girl open the coffin to let Sensei out. Sensei takes a look around the town, and he is now thoroughly convinced that he isn't in the same world anymore. Before they do anything, Annet says they should go to the castle and have an audience with the king, but they end up leaving the coffin in the middle of the road. Over the castle, King Thomas and his daughter, Charlotte are happy to meet them, and since they must be exhausted from such a long journey, he offers to let them all rest in the castle chambers for the night. But before that, he would love to hear some of Sensei's pleasant experiences. Sensei can't think of many pleasant things to talk about, but he did enjoy the coffin ride here, so he tells the king that he will teach him what it feels like to sleep in a coffin. Out of context, that clearly sounded like a threat, but Anna quickly changes the subject and compliments Charlotte on how beautiful she is. The king mentions that Charlotte is actually getting married soon, so he asks them for a little advice regarding Charlotte's suitors. Thomas calls for the men to be brought in, so we are introduced to the warrior, Gomes, and the wandering minstrel of Love Otto. Recently, due to the influence of the wrath of the demon lord, the activity of monsters has greatly increased recently, however, Thomas has grown too old to deal with the problem himself. So he decides that one of these two shall become Charlotte's husband and the next king of Roth. However, Charlotte doesn't seem to be on board with the idea since she hasn't chosen a husband yet. That's why he's leaving the choice up to a bunch of strangers he met 10 minutes ago. He wants them to pick who is more suitable to marry Charlotte between Gomes and Otto. But as the choice prompt shows up, Sensei does the sensible thing and says he has never met these men in his life. Charlotte's future hinges on this decision, so he thinks it's dumb to entrust it to a bunch of strangers like this. And if this is something he would do without a second thought, then he's not fit to be king. The king is left in shock, and after saying that, Sensei turns to leave while Annette and the cat girl frantically try to apologize for Sensei's actions. They try to explain that Sensei is from another world, so he is a bit blunt at times, but the king says it's fine since he isn't the type to hold a grudge, and Charlotte seems to have taken an interest in him. That night, while everyone else is asleep, Sensei spends his time looking out the window, so Anna gets up and asks him if he is having trouble falling asleep, so Sensei tells her that he just never sleeps well. Anna wants to take the opportunity to learn more about Sensei, so she asks him to tell her about Saction. But then she notices a tail pop out from under Sensei's sheets, so she takes the covers off and sees Cat Girl sleeping on Sensei's thighs. She won't stand for such debauchery unless she is the one who gets to sleep with Sensei, so she uses a pillow to smack Cat Girl and wake her up. Cat Girl defends herself by saying it's cold and she's part cat, so it's totally normal for her to cuddle up to people for warmth. While Anna and Cat Girl continue arguing over this, Sensei gets up and leaves the room because of all the noise, and as he steps out into the hallway, he notices a beautiful light, so he goes out to look at the lake, and coincidentally, Charlotte is out here as well. Once she notices Sensei, she invites him to watch the lake with her since it's a beautiful night. Sensei agrees that the sight is very beautiful, so beautiful in fact that it makes him feel like drowning in the lake. Charlotte is shocked to hear him say this and asks if Sensei has enough problems to make him want to drown himself. But from what Sensei has seen so far, Charlotte seems a lot more trouble than him. After some silence, Charlotte confides in Sensei that she hasn't been able to make a decision between Gomes and Otto. Gomes had only recently arrived at the castle, but he is already the most reliable of their soldiers. 
Her father has faith in Gomes' strength, so she feels like she should probably choose him. But Otto was her childhood friend, and whenever she would feel down, he would always write a song and play it to make her feel better. She doesn't know whether to choose a husband whom she loves or one who would be the strongest king for the sake of her father. Since I laughs at himself a little and says Charlotte is truly kind for worrying about what her father thinks to this extent, unlike Sensei, who has attempted to cancel his subscription to life several times, always inconveniencing his family in the process. However, he has never once let someone else decide how he would live his life. He thinks Charlotte should make a decision based on what she wants, and to do that, she must figure out what her true desires are. The next day, King Thomas is called Sensei, and the others to the throne room again, and he apologizes for the inconvenience, but he called them here because Charlotte has finally decided who she will marry, so he wants them to act as a witness to her choice. Annette thinks Charlotte will surely marry Gomes since she is likely to put the needs of the kingdom above her own, while Catgirl thinks Otto is a much better match for her. Thomas tells Charlotte to go up to the man she has chosen and to speak her vows to him. So Charlotte begins walking, however, instead of turning to Otto or Gomes, she grabs hold of Sensi's hand and says she wishes to drown in the lake with him. No one can believe what they just heard, especially Annette who collapses to the ground. Charlotte goes on to explain her reasons, and after talking with Sensei last night, she thought about who to choose for a long time and that led her to realize something. While initially she was leaning towards picking Otto since he always sang to her when she felt sad, she now recalls that he sang to her even when she wasn't sad, and he was even singing last night as well, and he never said he was in love with her. So he probably just wanted to perform his newest song for someone and Charlotte just happened to be available to listen. And Gomes is a no-go as well since he smells awful. The king asks Charlotte to reconsider and choose a husband, which seems like an odd thing to be worried about after she declared her intentions to kick the bucket with Sensei. Charlotte snaps back at Thomas and tells him that it was a foolish idea to make her marry someone without asking for her opinion since she never even wanted to get married in the first place. In the end, Thomas never stopped to consider her feelings at all, but Sensei actually cared about what she thought and respected that it was her decision to make. Sensei now understands why Charlotte chose him, but before he can give her a response, Gomes takes off his helmet and says he never would have thought his cover would be blown because of his smell. He then transforms into his true form as a servant of the Dark Lord, and he says he had intended to acquire this kingdom by becoming its king so he could eventually hand it over to the Dark Lord, but his plan has been ruined since Charlotte saw through his disguise. Sensei looks over to Charlotte and asks her if she had figured out Gomes was a demon, but she had no idea whatsoever. She just said he smelled because he really does stink. That means Gomes just blew his cover for no reason, but he doesn't want to admit that he was mistaken. So now that his cover is blown, he says he will just kill them all. This is the exact kind of situation where a powerful priestess would be really helpful, but she is still currently unconscious, so Catgirl tries waking her up while Gomes is distracted with the guards. Unfortunately, the guards don't last very long, so Catgirl is forced to grab Annette's body and run to avoid being crushed by a pillar. Since Annette won't be waking up anytime soon, Catgirl decides to take matters into her own hands and fight Gomes herself. She is currently level 14, so she should be able to handle herself well in a fight. Since she'll be fighting, Otto offers to play her a song since he is level 89 and normally a buff would be applied to her. But it turns out that Otto is just playing his newest song and has no effects attached to it, other than it being a certified hood classic according to Sensei. Catgirl has no other choice but to begin attacking on her own. So as Gomes charges at her, Catgirl ducks underneath and kicks him across the face. She then follows it up with a cat punch, but it didn't really do much damage to Gomes, so he is able to send Catgirl flying. He then says he will put everything he has into his next attack and tear Catgirl to shreds, but before he does that, Sensei gets his attention and asks Gomes to please eliminate him and Charlotte first. Gomes doesn't think Sensei is serious at first, but Sensei reiterates that now that Charlotte is broken free from her idiotic father's control, her first wish is to end it all alongside Sensei, and Sensei is always up for a good chance to kick the bucket, so he asks Gomes to grant him this favor. Gomes agrees to kill him, but he says that after he does that, he will go on to kill the king, and then he will burn the city to the ground while killing every last citizen inside it. Sensei doesn't really care what Gomes does since she would be dead by then anyway, but Charlotte is starting to have second thoughts about dying. As Gomes begins charging at them, she tells Sensei that she can't let herself die yet since she wants to stay alive and protect the kingdom. Sensei is glad to hear that Charlotte finally understands what she really wants, so since she wants to stay alive, he pushes her out of the way so that he is the only one who will be pulverized. As Gomes continues to charge straight at Sensei, Charlotte tries to convince him not to let himself get impaled, but luckily, at the same time, Anna had just woken up and she uses her power to cast a barrier of light in front of Sensei and shield him from Gomes' strike. She has vowed not to let Sensei die as long as she is by his side. 
So as Gomes tries to break through her shield, he ends up shattering his horns in the process, and now that Gomes is defenseless, Catgirl is able to land a blow that sends him flying through the castle wall and into the lake. Both Catgirl and Annette are relieved that they managed to survive, and since Annette really helped her out during the battle, Catgirl feels the need to thank her. Annette thanks Catgirl as well for her help, and the two of them seem to be getting along a lot better now. And Otto is still here, just playing his harp without a care in the world. Charlotte has a lot to think about after what just happened, but suddenly, her father runs up to her and starts begging for forgiveness for not considering her feelings earlier. Since I was right when he said Thomas isn't fit to be king, and he now realizes that he's not even fit to be Charlotte's father, so he sincerely asks Charlotte if she is willing to forgive him. Charlotte gets down and tells her father that she forgives him, and from now on, she would like to talk to him a lot about the future of this kingdom and themselves. Thomas is really happy that he was able to reconcile with Charlotte, and Charlotte is happy her father finally understands her, but all sense I can think of is how Annette and Catgirl messed up his perfect chance to get game over. A while later, Thomas acknowledged that he wasn't fit to rule as king, so he abdicated the throne to Charlotte, who now does everything in her power to make sure the kingdom is kept safe. And Otto is still making songs, since he's got nothing better to do. Meanwhile, Anna and Catgirl are busy dragging Sensi's coffin to their next destination, and they are talking about how bold it was for Charlotte to become the queen at the age of 16, but they are sure it will work out somehow. Sensei gets out of the coffin and says what's important is that Charlotte made the decision for herself and she is standing by it, which is something that Sensei thinks is beautiful. After driving Sensei for a long time, Catgirl asks Annette if they can take a break since she has gotten really tired. They covered a considerable amount of distance, so Anna thinks it's okay if they take a little break. Since they stop, Sensei opens the coffin and asks if it is time to eat yet. Anna offers him some bread, but Sensei says he only eats boiled tofu, so if she doesn't have any, He's just going to go back to sleep. After the break, Catgirl asks how much longer it will take before they arrive at her house, and since Annette is the one with the map, she says it looks like it will take a few more days before they get to her hometown, but before that, Annette asks to make a stop at the Zwieten Temple. Catgirl doesn't mind the delay, but she asks why Annette needs to go there, prompting her to start explaining the Isekai process. Normally, otherworlders arrive in this world through one of the four temples and head to fight the Dark Lord from there. But since Sensei's goal is to find Saction rather than defeating the Dark Lord, Annette wants to head to the temples to see if they can gather any information regarding Saction's whereabouts. If they are unlucky, they might end up having to travel across the whole world, but Annette is totally ready to leave everything behind for Sensei. In all honesty, she doesn't want Sensei to fight the Dark Lord even though it's her job to convince otherworlders to do it. She just doesn't want Sensei to be exposed to that kind of danger, so Catgirl trades her for being in love with Sensei. Anna denies any impure intentions even if it's painfully obvious at this point. She tries claiming that Sensei gave her a breath of fresh air when she was beginning to give up on her job, so she wants to repay the favor and help him find the person he is looking for, that's all. Catgirl asks if that means Anna would be alright with it if she found out Saction was actually Sensei's lover or something. But while the mere thought of Sensei having a lover is painful, she still wants to confirm for herself if it turns out to be true. By the way, Catgirl wonders if Annette will even be allowed to enter this Whiten Temple since she kind of ditched her job to go on this journey. Annette doesn't think it's going to be an issue since she's good friends with the person in charge of this Whiten Temple, and it's not like she just abandoned her post either since she had her familiar send in an official resignation letter for her. And coincidentally, that same familiar is back and currently chewing on Sensei's head. After healing Sensei, Annette complains that her familiar is always causing problems for her, and now that she says it out loud, she realizes it might have been a bad idea to leave the delivery of her resignation letter to this thing. Her suspicions are confirmed when it spits up her resignation letter, so now it looks like she abandoned her post without notice, and she blames the familiar for it. Seeing the familiar fail so hard at its one job brings a smile to Sensei's face, since he is a failure as well, so he names it Melos, and Melos takes an instant liking to Sensei. But Sensei doesn't really want a pet, so he just goes back into his coffin. Meanwhile, Annette is freaking out over the fact that she left her post without notice, so the temple is totally going to deny her unemployment claim later. Just then, Mela starts acting a little weird, and before long, he runs away, so something is clearly wrong. But it's not until a dragon descends from the mountaintop that they realize what Melos was trying to warn them about. A dragon is the strongest monster in the world, so Annette doesn't know what to do. But before the dragon attacks, a girl appears behind Annette and Catgirl, and she tells Ryuta to quit attacking random people. The girl then walks up to the dragon and begins petting it, so Anna and Catgirl are pretty confused by point. They've never heard of someone managing to tame a dragon before, so they ask who the girl is. 
However, she just turns to them and says there are a lot of monsters in the area, so they should hurry up and leave before they get hurt. In fact, it looks like one of their teammates has already died. Annette apologizes for the confusion and clarifies that Sensity is still very much alive, he is just a weird otherworlder, so he enjoys sleeping in a coffin. As soon as the girl hears that Sensity is an otherworlder, a switch flips in her head so she removes her cloak, revealing that she's a dragon girl, and says she will kill all otherworlders. The amount of power coming from her body is intense, so as she fires a blast at them, Annette is just barely able to hold it back for a couple of seconds with her shield, but her shield isn't strong enough as the blast still does a lot of damage. They are left sprawled out on the floor and they realize the dragon girl's power is far superior to theirs, but they are still determined to protect Sensei at all costs, so they get up to fight once more. However, the dragon girl has grown impatient with their meddling, so she uses her intense pressure to force them to the ground. And while they are unable to move, the girl stands over them, giving Annette a clear view of the mark on her neck, which she recognizes to be the mark of the raffled Dark Lord. The Dark Lord is about to finish off Annette and Cat Girl, but before she does, Sensei gets up and says there's no need for her to be so violent towards the others. She said her beef was with Otherworlders, and that means the person she wants to eliminate is him. He tells her she is free to do whatever she likes to him. And since he isn't putting up a fight, the Dark Lord agrees to leave the others alone, and in the next moment, she punches a hole straight through Sensei's chest. As Sensei falls to the ground, the Dark Lord declares that her name is Waldelia, and she tells Sensei to rest in peace. But as she is leaving, Sensei gets back up and begins to laugh at the fact that Waldelia actually stabbed him. He can tell that she is harboring hatred within her heart since he once felt the same and wanted to stab someone. He even went as far as to write a threatening letter at the time so he knows what it feels like to be consumed by hatred. Waldelia is starting to get freaked out at this point, but Sensei keeps getting closer and touches her cheek, hitting her with that dying man Reese. He says he would love to hear her story, but Waldelia isn't going to fall for his charms so easily, so she calls for Ryuka to get her out of here before she gets rizzed up. After she is gone, Sensei collapses once more since he still has a hole in his chest, but Melis is still around, so he finally makes himself useful and drags all of them to the temple, and upon seeing the poor condition Annette is in, she rushes to check on her, but Annette asks her to take care of Sensei first because he is in much worse condition. Isha sees it's really bad, so she calls for every healing potion and available priest to help Sensei recover. By the next day, Sensei is back up to full health, but he can't have that, so the first thing he does is go out and buy a bottle of poison to drink. While he does that, Annette thanks Isha for all her help and says she'll make sure to repay the favor someday. For now, Annette asks if Isha has come across an otherworlder named Saction by any chance, but she has never heard of her, so Isha assumes she must have been summoned to another temple. More importantly, Isha asks Annette why she is traveling with an otherworlder all of a sudden. She was shocked when she heard that Annette ditched her job, but she was also kind of relieved since she knew Annette was too kind-hearted to be exposed to this kind of job. However, she can't support Annette's decision to travel with an otherworlder since she should know from first-hand experience that they are all pretty much scumbags. They are given divine gifts to defeat the Dark Lord, yet all of them call their gifts overpowered skills and use them for dumb things like starting a failing rap career. This goofball is called Kotaro, and he was unfortunately given the power to destroy the world's economy by mass-producing gold coins. He offers to buy the girls whatever they want in return for some fun time, but Aisha throws his gold back in his face and tells him to leave because she is having a serious conversation over here. Kotaro was annoying, but he helped prove Aisha's point that otherworlders aren't good people. Anna tries to explain that Sensei isn't like the rest of the otherworlders, but Aisha doesn't believe it since Sensei's face says he's a destructive person. She warns Annette that being around Sensei will ruin her, but Annette doesn't think Sensei is a bad influence since she is sure she has changed for the better ever since she met Sensei. But her argument about Sensei being a good influence doesn't sound very convincing when he comes over to her asking for money to buy drugs, and she happily gives him as much money as he needs too, so Isha thinks Annette might be too far gone already. If Annette is already this attached to Sensei, Isha at least wants to know what kind of gift he has, but she is surprised when Annette tells her Sensei doesn't have a gift. And despite not having a gift, he still put himself in harm's way to protect her and Catgirl from the Dark Lord, but this statement shocks Isha even more as the Dark Lord was reportedly killed seven days ago by some other worlders. We then see the bloodstained throne of the former Dark Lord, and the other worlder who killed the Dark Lord sitting on it. And from a distance, Waldelia looks on, squaring to avenge her father's death. A while later, Annette meets with Catgirl and informs her of the news that the Dark Lord was already slain seven days ago. Isha received the news from the church yesterday, and it's a wonderful thing since it means peace have finally come to Zauberberg. But if it's true that the Dark Lord is dead, 
then who was the one who tried to kill him earlier? Anna doesn't know the answer to that question. And now that Catgirl thinks about it, didn't Sensei also show up seven days ago? If the Dark Lord had already been defeated by then, then why was Sensei still summoned to this world? Just then, Sensei tears up his papers and collapses to the floor, so Catgirl asks what's wrong with him now. He explains that he has been trying to write about the events that have occurred since he arrived in this world, but he is struggling to find the words. Annette asks if he wrote anything about her, but Sensei says he didn't write about her at all. If anything, he got a surge of creativity after meeting Waldelia, so he would like to experience something similar to spark his creativity, but Catgirl says she's not going to do anything dangerous with him. Annette suggests they all go out into town to relax and considering her future with Sensei, there are a few things Annette would like to buy for him. Upon entering town, Annette buys a huge set of heavy armor for Sensei to make sure he doesn't die and Sensei doesn't really mind it since the tight feeling reminds him of his coffin. With Sensei's safety ensured, Annette and Catgirl head off to do some more shopping, so she asks Sensei not to go anywhere while they are gone. A while later, as she is walking through town where she sees a couple kids gathered around the suit of armor, and she's shocked to find Sensei snugly sitting inside. Ignoring the question of why he's in such huge armor, Etcha says there's something she wanted to talk to Sensei about. She says that from now on, Anna is going to be staying with her since she believes staying with Sensei will ultimately make her unhappy. She tells Sensei to dissolve his party with Annette immediately, but Sensei just grins and tells her that Anna is the only one who can decide whether she wants to stay with him or not, so it's not up to Isha to decide for her. Besides, how can Isha be so sure that Sensei will make Annette unhappy when she knows nothing about him? But the fact that he's an otherworlder is all the proof she needs to know that Annette would be better off without him. Just then, Isha hears an unsettling sound and as she goes to investigate, she finds Kotero introducing another otherworlder, Suzuki, to the people. Suzuki tells the crowd that the Dark Lord has finally been defeated, so they all begin to cheer for the otherworlders who gave them their freedom from the Dark Lord. Suzuki corrects the crowd since he wouldn't exactly call this being freed, it's more like they are under new management. He declares that from now on, this world will be ruled by the Otherworlders and Suzuki will be taking over this town. So he demands that all the people kneel to him. Just then, Kotaro spots Annette and tells that she's one of the elves who smacked coins in his face, so Suzuki gets up and yells at her for daring to harm an Otherworlder, and he's going to make sure she never does something like that again. After placing his hand on Annette's head, Suzuki activates his skill, and within moments, Annette's eyes go dark as she falls under his control. Something is clearly wrong, so once Catgirl realizes that Suzuki has done something to Annette, she grabs Kotero by the jacket and demands to know what happened to her. Potato, I mean Kotero snickers and tells her that there's nothing she can do now that Suzuki's skill has been activated, because it turns anyone he pets into his mindless slave. Catgirl is enraged, so she threatens to beat Kotero up until he gets Suzuki to turn Annette back to normal. But before she could do that, Suzuki had already put his hand on top of her head and used his ability to turn her into an obedient slave as well. Things have gotten out of hand, so Isha finally comes out and confronts Suzuki for misusing his ability when she taught him to only use it for good. But Suzuki couldn't care less about Aisha's disapproval because he's the one with all the power here. And since Isha and the townspeople are so insistent on opposing him, he decides to just destroy the town completely to set an example and rebuild it as a place where no one will dare to stand up to him again. He then turns to leave, but before he does, he turns to Aisha and tells her he will be taking over her church and using it as his castle from now on. The attack dogs proceed to destroy the town under Suzuki's orders, including Catgirl, who is currently attacking the suit of armor Sensei was stuffed into earlier. Sensei isn't alarmed in the slightest by Catgirl's robin behavior, and in fact, he finds it amusing that Annette was actually right about him needing armor in case of emergencies like this. Eventually, Catgirl's punches deal enough damage to shatter the plating of the armor, but in the process, she causes the helmet to go flying straight into her face, which knocks her out instantly. Sensei is now free from the armor, and since Catgirl is unconscious on the ground, he does the only thing he can think to do and stuffs her in a barrel so she doesn't hurt anyone. After he does this, Isha comes crashing into the building beside him, and for once she's actually relieved to see Sensei's face. But she still stands firm on her earlier statements as Suzuki is a prime example of what otherworlders are like. Not only did Suzuki use his gift for his own selfish desires, but his greed has also led him to become a danger to society. The power from his gift must have gone straight to his head, since he wasn't like this when he first arrived in this world. Initially, he was a shy and weak-willed man, but now he has turned into a monster. Hearing Ezra describe Suzuki's descent into evil gives Sensei the spark of inspiration he has been looking for, so he asks Isha where Suzuki is right now, and he is informed that Suzuki should be in the church right now, so he asks Isha to watch Catgirl while he goes to see Suzuki. 
Isha tells him to wait since it's crazy for Sensei to go after a hero and doesn't have a gift. But Sensei still insists on going since he believes Suzuki's story will be an interesting topic to write about. So Isha relents and says she will go with him to ensure his safety. As they arrive at the church doors, Sensei is excited. But Isha can't understand how Sensei is so calm in a situation like this. He has already seen what Suzuki's gift is capable of doing, so he should know that he stands no chance of winning in an honest fight. If Sensei opens the door without a plan, she tells him he will be torn apart by Suzuki's beasts, but as she says this, Sensei pulls a bottle of poison out from his sleeve. Isha is impressed since she believes that Sensei must be planning to use poison to take out the beasts, but to her shock, he just shoves the entire thing in one gulp. Since they can't use the poison anymore, Isha gets down on all fours and tells Sensei that they are going to have to use the back door now. But once again, Sensei doesn't listen to her and walks straight through the front door. Sensei greets Suzuki and tells him that he is interested in writing a novel about his story, so Suzuki thinks Sensei is a fan of his, wishing to document his heroic deeds. But the reality is quite the contrary as Sensei says that the story he wishes to write is about a loser who was given more power than he deserved and ultimately turned into a scumbag. Suzuki feels insulted, so he orders his dogs to rip Sensei to shreds and Sensei is still just standing there, so Isha takes it upon herself to defend him. She casts a spell that fires lasers into the dog's head, but eventually she is overwhelmed, so Suzuki orders his remaining beasts to shoot fireballs at Sensei. Since Aisha isn't able to protect him, it looks like Sensei is in real danger here. But at the last second, the fireballs get deflected by a floating helmet and go flying back at Suzuki. It turns out that Melos was the one making the helmet float and the fireballs were reflected because the armor is capable of deflecting low-level spells. Kotaro is starting to freak out since it's clear that Sensei is blessed by the gods of plot armor, but Suzuki tells him to calm down since he still has one more trick up his sleeve, which is sure to bring Sensei down. He orders his great wolf to attack Sensei, but as the wolf bites into him, it suddenly begins to decay and falls to the ground. Isha can't believe Sensei drinking that bottle of poison actually saved them, and by now, Kotaro is 100% sure that Suzuki can't beat Sensei's plot armor, so he takes off running. Suzuki has to admit that Sensei is more formidable than he had first thought, but he still has one more card to play, so he orders Anna to come out and kill them. Anna has no control over her actions, so she charges at Isha with a dagger and nearly stabs her, so Isha is forced to back away. And since she doesn't want to fight Annette, she thinks it's best if they retreat for now. However, Sensei doesn't think that is going to be necessary since Anna should be strong enough to resist the mind control on her own. Suzuki calls him a fool since his mind control is impossible to dispel once it has been activated, so Anit is due to be his slave for the rest of her life. Yet, Sensei still believes Anit is strong enough to overcome it on her own. So he walks right up to her knife and tells Anit that she doesn't have to listen to what Suzuki tells her to do. He seems to be getting through to her since Anit starts holding herself back from stabbing Sensei, and Suzuki doesn't like it one bit. So he uses all this power to try to force her to stab him, but through sheer force of will and a flashback, Anna is able to overcome the brainwashing by stabbing herself in the leg. The pain snaps her out of it, so she ends up falling into Sensei's arms. And now that Anna is back to her usual self, Sensei asks Isha to treat her leg wound and Aisha is starting to realize that she may have misjudged Sensei as a person. Meanwhile, now that Suzuki knows his ability isn't all powerful, he realizes that he's going to be held accountable for all his war crimes. And he can't bear the thought of the punishment he will have to endure at the hands of the people he has oppressed. So he looks around for the knife and attempts to use it to off himself. But at the last second, Sensei stops him from stabbing his throat, but not really because he cares about Suzuki's life, he just hasn't finished writing his story yet. He wants Suzuki to tell him all about his life, so since he has nothing left to lose, Suzuki starts telling him all about his life back on Earth. He was a high school student who got bullied relentlessly by the bigger kids. He was timid and weak, so he could never truly stand up for himself. He even had thoughts of back flipping off the roof so he wouldn't have to deal with the bullies anymore, but ultimately, he was too much of a coward to go through with it. On his way home that day, a drunk old man bumped into him and then proceeded to yell as if it were Suzuki's fault, so Suzuki was obviously angry, but he still didn't have the will to stand up for himself. Overall, he was a miserable person, which made him a prime target for Truck-kun. And before he knew it, he was transported to this world and greeted by Aisha as a hero chosen to defeat the Demon Lord. From there, he was left to level up on his own and had to fight the wolves before ultimately making them his faithful servants. And once he had command over strong allies, he was finally able to defeat powerful monsters. He believed things were finally getting better for him, but as he walked through town, he realized that despite his newfound power, people here still treated him like an outcast just like people on Earth. And eventually, the thought that he may end up getting bullied here made him reach his breaking point. 
He had suffered endless torment on Earth and suddenly found himself being proclaimed a hero, but he had no reason to want to save this new world or be its hero. Although even when he tried to play the part of a villain, he couldn't even do that. Sensei is pleased with the story Suzuki just told because it allowed him to finish his novel. It's about a pitiful man who could neither become a hero nor a villain due to his own weakness. He's an outcast no matter what world he goes to. So Sensei decides to call the novel Isekai Shikaku. And as he names it, pages from the novel begin floating around Suzuki. Sensei thanks Suzuki for his story since it allowed him to write something he was satisfied. But he still cannot call this a masterpiece, so takes a page from the novel and rips it apart. As he does this, a magic circle appears beneath Suzuki, and both Isha and Annette recognize it to be the summoning circle they use to bring heroes to this world. But this one is acting in reverse, so in a flash of light, Suzuki is unsummoned and sent back to Earth. Annette checks Sensei's status screen, and to her surprise, it now says he has a gift when it clearly wasn't there before. Isha realizes that it must be some kind of special skill and only activates against Otherworlders, which can only mean Sensei was brought to this world to fight Otherworlders. After he's done, Sensei collapses to the ground, and he's disappointed that he couldn't create a masterpiece like he wanted, and it looks like he is oblivious to the power his writing possesses as he starts wondering what happened to Suzuki. With Suzuki having been reverse Isekai, all the monsters under his control stop being aggressive and begin leaving the town. And Catgirl finally gets herself out of the barrel, although she can't figure out why she was in there to begin with. After things go back to normal, Isha thinks Sensei deserves a reward for saving the town from Suzuki, so at his request, she has a custom coffin made for him. Annette thanks Isha for all the help she has offered, but before she goes, Isha says there is something important she would like to discuss with Annette. She tells Annette that it is very likely that Sensei is an incredibly important hero to this world, and that means traveling with him is bound to be insanely dangerous. But after seeing the willpower Annette possesses, Isha believes Anna can handle any challenges that come her way. So she asks her to support Sensei to the best of her ability. After that, the group is ready to continue their journey, so Catgirl and Annette both grab the ropes to be inhaling Sensei's coffin. But before they go, Isha says she has a question for Sensei. It's true that Suzuki turned out to be a rotten hero, but considering the fact that he was nice before he was given his powers and exposed to this world, she can't help but feel like he only turned out that way because he was summoned. And now that he has been sent back to Earth, he may be doomed to continue his miserable life. However, Sensei sees it differently, since while Suzuki's story as a hero of this world is over, his story on Earth is still in progress, and it's up to him to change things for the better. After Sensei and the others had left, Isha went to the headquarters of the church to report the recent events. As she arrives, she notices a colleague of hers, Wolf, sitting and drinking all his sorrows away. She is appalled that he would be drinking so early in the day, but he says he has to because his job is a lot more stressful than hers. While Aisha gets to deal with other people like her, Wolf is forced to deal with dwarves, and dwarves smell absolutely terrible. However, before he can continue insulting dwarves, Elton comes in and tells Wolf that it's not right for him to be saying such racist things while at work, especially since he's a bishop. Wolf half-heartedly apologizes, but he also kind of insults Elton for being a goblin bishop, when most bishops are elves. Goblin doesn't take much offense to this and points out that Wolf is acting worse than the dwarves he claims to hate so much. This sets Wolf off, so he dares Goblin to try dealing with the dwarves all day and see whether he still isn't racist after that. All of a sudden, they are both interrupted as Cardinal Miller arrives and tells them to stop bickering and take their seats, so they can get this meeting started. Once the meeting begins, Miller apologizes for summoning all of them here on such short notice. He would like to begin the meeting by having each region, but there's it looks like there's someone missing. However, before he can start talking, another bishop arrives and stumbles onto the floor in front of them. None of them have any idea who this girl is, so Miller introduces her as the new bishop of the Western Temple who is taking over after Annette ditched her job. They all get seated and Miller asks for the bishops to begin their reports, starting with Aria. She introduces herself as Annette's replacement and reports that nothing noteworthy has happened in her region. The Cardinal mentions that he heard Princess Charlotte inherited the throne recently, and that seems noteworthy, so Aria apologizes for forgetting to mention that. While Aria is begging to not be fired, the goblin bishop, Elton, interrupts her and begins his own report. He states that his region has experienced nothing but peace recently, so he doesn't have much to report. Wolf goes up next and gives his report on his territory. It's located way out in the middle of nowhere, but it's doing alright. There is the occasional conflict between dwarves every now and then, but it's normal, so there's no reason to be worried about it. Next up is Aisha, and while all the others didn't have much to report, she has terrible news to give. Recently, an otherworlder went on a rampage within her region and destroyed half of the town of Vale. 
She is currently working on having the town restored to normal, but on the topic of Otherworlders, Miller actually called this meeting because of the Otherworlders. As he informed them all a week ago, the raffled Dark Lord was defeated by a group of Otherworlders. And in light of this, the Pope has decided to seal the magic circles that connect this world to the others and put Truk-Kun on indefinite paid leave. Elton is glad the battle with the Dark Lord is finally over, but there's still a looming threat over this world. The seven other worlders who defeated the Dark Lord have all claimed the land once ruled by the Dark Lord as their own. And the Pope has received a declaration from those seven, stating they will transform Zauberberg into the perfect utopia. This clearly sounds like a declaration of war, and the Pope is greatly distressed by their threat since the other worlders were meant to be angels sent from above to save this world, and he truly cared for them. However, now they've turned against him, and the Church has to prepare for the impending danger. They also have to worry about the Otherworlders who have been causing chaos in each region, and the daughter of the Dark Lord who disappeared from his castle. None of them ever thought the day would come when the Otherworlders would become the enemies of the Church, and if they worked together, the Otherworlders would become a far greater threat than the Dark Lord ever was. Arya is worried about how they are going to fight such strong people, but Aisha has an idea of how they could manage it. She informs the others that there is a particular Otherworlder who was able to use his gift to send another Otherworlder back to his own world. The others are shocked to hear this, but if Isha's hypothesis is correct, then they will be able to send the Otherworlders back to their own worlds with Sensei's gift. Just then, the Pope arrives to the shock of everyone there, and he is delighted to hear such good news. He asks Isha to fill him in on the details of this man. Meanwhile, within the Dark Lord's territory, two of the seven Otherworlders who had taken down the Dark Lord remain in the castle, while the other five have set out for various different regions to claim them for their new empire, and the two left behind are eager to see what's about to happen to this world. Back with Sensei and the others, they finally manage to make it to their destination, and Catgirl is excited to finally get to sleep in a bed again. But all of a sudden, she gets a notification from her system that due to all her coffin pulling, her level has risen to level 17. Leveling up is nice, she doesn't seem pleased by the way it happened. For now, Anna thinks they should start by looking for an inn to spend the night at, and out of nowhere, a voice tells them that there is a good inn down the road. Anna looks up and spots a little boy sitting on a signpost, and he offers to give her some information that will help her navigate this town since she's new here. The boy tells her that there's a hero dispatch service in this town, and essentially, otherworlders accompany parties who lack confidence in their skills on missions, ensuring their safety and making the mission as smooth as possible. The boy says he came up with the idea himself, but as soon, as he mentioned Otherworlders, Catgirl gets flashbacks to what Kotaro and Suzuki did, so she wants nothing to do with it. The boy doesn't understand why she dislikes Otherworlders so much since they are the ones who saved this world, but that aside, he says if they are interested, he can introduce them to an Otherworlder right away. For a small fee, of course, he asks for 40,000 Jinko to do the introduction, but Catgirl tells him they don't want to since she doesn't want to waste that much money. However, Annette is more than happy to waste that much money if it means she can get a strong hero to keep Sensei safe. The boy thinks she is talking about guarding the coffin, so he begins giving a speech about how the dead guy would probably appreciate having his body guarded. However, Sensei pops out of the coffin and tells the boy that he's not dead yet, but he wishes he was. The boy is scared out of his mind, but Catgirl tells him that despite how he looks, Sensei is also a hero. However, the boy doesn't believe her. He quickly snatches the money from Annette and tells them that he will bring the hero to their inn later tonight. Even though Catgirl wasn't on board with the idea at first, she does admit that it would be nice to have a strong hero join their party, since it would mean she doesn't have to drive the coffin anymore. But Annette actually enjoys pulling the coffin though. Later that night, they are all waiting at the inn for Nura to arrive like he said he would, but Sensei tells Annette that the boy isn't going to be coming here anytime soon. To put it simply, she's been scammed. Hearing this, the innkeeper asks Annette if she happens to be waiting for a kid named Namir, and upon confirming this, the one informs them that Nur is notorious around here for being a young scam artist. He's never even met a hero before, so there's no way he could introduce Annette to a hero like he claimed he would. Annette is devastated that she just lost 40,000, so Catgirl tries to get her to calm down. Sensei wants to know a bit more about Nur, so the innkeeper explains that Nur is an orphan who just showed up in town one day and since then, he has been making a living by scamming unsuspecting travelers who come to the town. He is a nuisance to the town, but sometimes, the innkeeper can't help but feel sorry for him since he has no parental figures to correct him, and he is all on his own. At the same time, Nir is sitting under a bridge and staring at an old sword he has, but moments later he gets snatched up by some unknown kidnappers. They take him to an abandoned shed where they take a look at all the money Nir has swindled throughout his time as a scammer. Nir asks them what they plan to do with him and the three guys have got some evil intentions in their eyes, 
So Mir starts trying to bluff his way out of the situation by claiming his hero friend will get revenge on them if they try to harm him. However, the guys aren't worried since they know for sure that Nir has never met a hero, and as a matter of fact, they happen to be heroes themselves. One of them has a gift that allows him to summon a powerful crossbow. And since Nir has been so carelessly using the name of the heroes to scam people, the other worlder is going to punish him with an arrow to the head. Nir can't believe the heroes he looked up to are actually scumbags, but he comes to terms with it and awaits his death. However, at the last second, Sensei shows up and pushes the Bauman's hand, redirecting the arrow into the knee of the metal man. Sensei tells them that they have no right to call themselves heroes when they act like this. His words are promptly ignored as the one with glowing eyes uses his skill to analyze Sensei, and to his shock, he discovers that Sensei is an otherworlder as well. This puts them all on edge since they don't know what kind of power Sensei might have, but upon closer inspection, the appraiser realizes that Sensei only has one point of HP left, and he is currently poisoned for some reason. This gets the Bowman to calm down since he now thinks he can easily beat Sensei. But the second Sensei hears the Bowman say he is going to end him, his interest goes through the roof, and he starts walking straight towards them. The appraiser starts freaking out since Sensei's health stats are suddenly increasing at rapid rate, and Sensei begins daring the Bowman to shoot him right in the heart. So the Bowman thinks this is some kind of trap for Sensei's abilities and runs away with his friends. As they leave, Sensei is disappointed since he was really hoping that they would finish him off. Mir speaks up and asks Sensei if he is a hero, but Sensei denies being someone as noble as that. He's just a man trying to make it through the world of adults. Adults can often be cruel and conniving, but Nir is still a child, so he thinks he should try and preserve his innocence a little longer before he ends up as bad as those rotten otherworlders. Sensei then begins to leave, and Mir feels inspired by his speech, but his inspiration soon turns to panic as Sensei walks out of sight and Mir realizes that Sensei forgot to untie him, so he's going to be stuck here all night. The next morning, Sensei and the others are getting ready to leave town to continue their journey, but Catgirl notices that Sensei seems to be sleepy, so she asks him if he managed to get good night's sleep. Now that Anna thinks about it, she recalls that Sensei snuck off somewhere last night without telling them where he was going. So she asks him if he spent the night with woman or something. Sensei doesn't say anything other than he had an eventful night, and Annette is seriously crying over the possibility that another woman got to Sensei before her. However, they get interrupted by Mirror, who says they should hurry up so everyone can start going. As soon as Catgirl recognizes him, she starts yelling for him to give them back their money for lying to them, but Nira maintains that he never lied to them since he has indeed brought a hero to join their party. And he is that hero, although he isn't very strong. They continue their journey, but shortly after, all of them get thrown in jail. They took Catgirl somewhere else, Onur assumes she must be the reason they all got locked up and speculates that she might have stolen from the royal family or something. Anna doesn't believe it since she knows Catgirl isn't the kind of person to steal from others, but right now, despite their predicament, Sensei is more concerned with finding out what kind of execution method this world uses. Anna refuses to tell him since she doesn't want to give him any ideas, but Sensei already has a bunch of execution images in his head. In any case, Onur thinks they should at least try to escape by themselves even if it is without Catgirl for now, but Anna doesn't know how they are going to do that. However, before she even realizes it, Nur has already picked the lock on the cell and earned them their freedom. It's not a skill an honorable warrior would have, but it's hard to argue with results. However, Sensei is a little upset that Nur managed to get them free since now they aren't going to be executed, but moments later, the guards notice them trying to get out of the cell. So they are all locked up again, and Sensei is quite pleased since this means they might get executed again. They are brought before the king of the kingdom of Grun, and he says they have committed a very severe crime against the kingdom, so they are going to be executed. Sensei is happy to hear this, but Annette pleads for them to reconsider since they only got here recently and haven't committed any crime since they got here. But on the contrary, the king says they have committed the worst crime of all. He says they kidnapped the princess of this kingdom, Matilda, so there will be no leniency with their punishment. Just then, Catgirl walks in to put a stop to this whole execution thing, and the others are shocked to discover that she is Princess Matilda. She tells her father that her friends didn't kidnap her, she just went on a journey across the lands so that she could improve her combat ability, and she happened to meet them along the way, so they'd done nothing wrong. Even though the king now knows that Sensei and the others are innocent, he still refuses to release them and instead decides to use the lives of Matilda's friends as blackmail to get her to behave. He says he will only let them live if Matilda agrees to never do anything foolish like running away again. He just wants her to be a good princess and listen to what he says from now on. Matilda doesn't want to agree to that, but since it's the only way to save the others, she eventually caves in and swears that she will act in a manner befitting a princess. As much as she hates this, she has no choice but to turn her back on her friendship with them. 
and since she agreed to the king's demands, they are allowed to go free. That night, the three of them gather at a bar, and Nir is happy that they weren't executed after all, and he barely knows Matilda to begin with, so he isn't upset about her being forced to leave the party. Meanwhile, Sensei is really upset, but more so because he really wanted to get executed. Even though Mirror doesn't really care, he still finds it really surprising that Catgirl turned out to be the princess of a nation and Annette is borderline mortified because being rude to royalty is punishable by death, and she's been rude to Catgirl countless times, and for that matter, it was already really rude that they've been calling her Catgirl this entire time without asking for her name. While Annette is agonizing over her past actions, the waitress overhears her mention Matilda's name, so she asks if they happen to know Princess Matilda by any chance. Annette confirms this, so the waitress introduces herself as Fawn and says she used to work as Matilda's maid. Nur explains that they traveled together with Matilda up until yesterday, but then the king dragged her back to the castle and forbade her from going on any more adventures. It's unfortunate, but it can't be helped since she's royalty, however. Fawn's expression after hearing what happened to Matilda leads Sensei to believe that there is more to the story than it would seem, so he asks Fawn if she could tell him all about what happened between Matilda and her father. Annette thinks it might be rude to pry into the personal life of Matilda now that they know that she is royalty, but none of that matters to Sensei, because to him, Matilda will always just be the same old cat girl he knows. Meanwhile, Matilda is in the castle, recalling how funny Annette and Mira looked when they realized that she's a princess, but Sensei still acted the same way he always does. She wonders what the others are up to right now, but as she is looking out the window, she notices a figure standing on the building nearby, and in the next few moments, that figure causes mass destruction to the castle. After all the chaos, the king and his guards are alerted to the presence of an intruder, but by the time they arrive, the intruder has already had the chance to take a seat on the throne, and he begins talking about how disappointed he is with the kingdom of Grun, but he hasn't gotten the chance to taste a demi-human girl yet, so he thought he would swing by. The king demands for the intruder to identify himself, so he announces that his name is Kagbara, and he is one of the seven otherworlders who defeated the Dark Lord, although he is more commonly known as the Fallen Angel of Gluttony now. The king asks Kagbara what he is doing here, but it's obvious by now that Kagbara has come to consume the entire nation. While they know Kagbara has powers, the soldiers of the kingdom are still willing to risk their lives to protect the kingdom. However, as they charge forward, Kagbara summons his gluttonous mouth and chomps down on them. He is disgusted by the taste of the demi-human men, and that's because he is very particular about what he eats. He says he only wants to eat the soft flesh of a demi-human girl, but the king is obviously never going to let that happen, so he decides that he will face Kaibara himself. Kaibara is amused that the king thinks he can stop him, so he pulls out his mouth and uses it to launch spit bullets at Siberian. Siberian blocks the attack with a piece of rubble on the floor and then closes the distance to attack Kaibara with a lightning fist. At first, it looks like it is working, but it turns out that Kaibara was just pretending to be in pain. That lightning fist would have killed any normal person, but Kaibara's body is just really tough since he ate a bunch of golems the other day. Seeing that his regular punches aren't going to be effective, Siberian decides to go all out and use his most powerful move to take Kaibara down. Kaibara is intrigued to see what the king can do, so he charges forward as well, but before they can clash, Matilda butts in and interrupts the fight. As soon Kaibara spots Matilda, he is dead set on tasting her succulent flesh. Matilda recognizes him as the person that was standing on the roof before the castle got attacked, so she tears her dress and says she will help Siberian fight him. However, Siberian refuses her help and tells her that she can't replace her brother, no matter how hard she tries. Meanwhile, Sensei and the others are hearing the story of Matilda's brother from Fawn. Her brother was named Leon, and he was set to inherit the throne of Grun. The future of the kingdom looked bright with the valiant Leon as the next king and the kind-hearted Matilda beside him, but one day, tragedy struck as Leon and Matilda's mother, La Palma, both got caught in a serious cave-in and, as a result, they lost their lives. Siberian was in great pain over the loss of his wife and son, and so was Matilda. So she decided that she would take over the responsibilities of her brother in order to put her father at ease. But contrary to what Matilda desired, her attempts to replace her brother only created a rift between her and Siberian. Now in the present, Siberian is trying to convince her to run away instead of fighting, but Matilda feels like she needs to prove that she is a capable fighter, so she leaps into the air to attack Kaibara. Unfortunately, she is the exact kind of demi-human that Kaibara wants to eat, so as she is approaching him, he summons the mouth and attempts to swallow her whole, but at the last second, she is pushed out of the way by Siberian, although he loses an arm in the process. Kaibara was hoping to see what Siberian's ultimate technique could do, but I guess he won't be able to use it anymore since Kaibara ate his arm. 
Matilda is enraged, so she charges at Kaibara again, but that didn't work out so well the last time she tried it, so Siberian's advisor knocks Matilda out and runs away with her so she doesn't get killed. Kaibara is disappointed that his mule just ran away from him, but he says it's fine since we'll catch up to her eventually, so for now, he will finish off Siberian. After hearing the story of Matilda's past from Fawn, Sensei thanks her for the wonderful story since it was quite inspiring. But all of a sudden, Siberian's advisor comes flying out of the sky and lands right in front of them. Fawn recognizes Briard and he is glad to see her again, but he tells everyone that he had to make a hasty escape from the castle because it has been taken over by an evil otherworlder. Just then, an explosion occurs from the castle, and once everyone's attention has been garnered, Kaibara addresses them all and says that he is declaring himself as the new king of Grun since he has defeated Siberian. And as the new king, the only thing he desires is to get a taste of all the different varieties of demi-humans. But he only wants to eat women and children, so the men can keep going about their business like normal. The people are understandably enraged by Kaibara's declaration, so one man threatens to beat him up however in the next moment, Kaibara swallows the guy whole, and he tells the people that if they are not satisfied with him eating only women and children, he can eat the men too so everyone can be together in his stomach. The people now understand how dangerous Kaibara is, so they all try to flee the capital, however it's of no use since Kaibara already went through the liberty of stationing various monsters at the gates, so no one is leaving here until he has gotten his fill of demi-human meat. Mir is shocked by how deranged Kaibara is, but Sensei is intrigued because he believes he has found his next story. Matilda was recently confined by her father, and now she is the princess of a falling nation, so by all means, her story is one of tragedy, but it's not over yet, so Sensei wants to see how she overcomes this challenge. Matilda eventually wakes up, and she is confused as to why she is in Fawn's house, but then she gets a glimpse of the chaos in the streets, and she is reminded of the Kaibara situation. She runs out the front door, and she is surprised to see Sensei and the others there. But now that she is awake, Briard tells Matilda that Kaibara has taken over the kingdom and is trying to eat the citizens. So Matilda begins angrily marching off to face him, however, Briard holds her back and says it is not a good idea to go face him, since even the kind stood no chance against Kaibara's power. Matilda tells everyone that Siberian was actually holding his ground against Kaibara, and the only reason he was defeated is because she ran into danger and he had to protect her. So she needs to make up for her mistake. And besides, she has a responsibility to protect the people of this nation since Leon isn't around anymore. Before Matilda can walk off, Annette mentions the tragedy that resulted in the death of two royals. She had heard of the accident before, but she never knew the people involved were Matilda's brother and mother. After they lost their lives, there wasn't a single citizen of Grun that didn't mourn them greatly, which is proof of how beloved the royal family is here. So if the people lose Matilda now, they would lose all the hope they still have. For now, as the princess of Grun, Matilda can't afford to be putting herself in danger so casually, so the three of them will go handle Kaibara in her place. Matilda wasn't there to see it last time, but Sensei has a power that can defeat otherworlders, so everything will be alright. Sensei seems to be on board with the idea of confronting Kaibara, but as they arrive at the castle doors and are stopped by two monsters, Sensei says he came here because he wants to get eaten by Kaibara. After all the time he spent thinking about different execution methods, it never occurred to him that being eaten might be an interesting way to meet his end, which is why he wants the monsters to inform Kaibara that someone is here to be eaten. The monsters are confused, so they lock the three of them up in a cell. In the meantime, Anna is crying her eyes out because she thinks they are really going to be eaten. But while Sensei is interested in the possibility of getting eaten, he didn't actually come here just to die. He already had a plan in mind for their escape, so he reminds Mir that these are the same castle prison cells that Nir helped them escape from this morning, so he can truly pick the lock again. At the same time, Matilda comes to the palace to confront Kaibara, and he's quite happy to see her here since it saves him a lot of trouble chasing after her. Although he is disappointed that she is going to fight him since he won't get to savor her flesh properly this way. Matilda vows to defeat Kaibara with her own hands, but he suddenly charges at her with Siberian's lightning fist technique and launches Matilda into a wall. She is shocked, but not just because of the lightning, rather because that move is one that only her father can use, so how did Kaibara pull it off? Kaibara explains that this is his unique skill, gluttony. It allows him to increase his stats by consuming flesh, and not only does he get different stat points depending on what kind of flesh he eats, he is also able to acquire the special skills that were held within that flesh. Meaning he is going to beat her to a pulp using her father's technique, and then eat what's left of her. Meanwhile, on the other side of the castle, Sensei and the others are walking through the halls after escaping their cells, and Annette is honestly surprised and impressed that Sensei actually had a plan back there and didn't just want to get eaten. But Sensei is really disappointed that he won't be eaten. 
They eventually arrive at a door, and this confuses Anna and Mira since they thought they were going to defeat Kaibara, but Sensei says this is exactly what he was looking for. They enter the room, but Anna is still wondering what Sensei could possibly need from the late queen's room. But then he starts searching through all the trunks and drawers until he eventually finds what he was after, book and quill. While they were doing this, Matilda is still getting knocked around by Kaibara as he appears behind her and performs a tiger kick to launch her into the air. He then jumps up and elbows her into the ground while mocking her for her mediocre martial arts skills. The fight looks to be over, but Matilda has a flashback to a moment where she was hanging out with Leon while he trained. She asks him why he was working so hard to become a fighter, when she knows he hates fighting and Leon admitted that he indeed wasn't much of a fighter, in fact Matilda probably has more talent for fighting than he does, but that is why he needed to train harder than anyone else, so he could become strong enough to protect those he cares about. This motivates Matilda to stand up once more, and despite knowing that Kaibara is much stronger than her, she refuses to back down. Kaibara laughs in excitement because there's no better feeling for him than eating the flesh of someone with as much willpower as Matilda, so he is truly going to savor every bite of her once he sinks his teeth in. He can now say with certainty that all the fruitless days in his old life have been leading up to this moment. Back on Earth, Kaibara's life was absolutely dreadful. He was born into an insanely rich family and grew up in a mega mansion where everything he could ever want was given to him. However, he was never happy with what he had, so his life always felt empty, which is why one day he decided to spice things up with a little murder. However, he was stopped before he could go through with it, so his desires remain unfulfilled. He didn't even face any consequences for his actions, since his parents paid the maid a lot of hush money to avoid a lawsuit. People kept calling him fortunate, but Kaibara could never understand why since he was always so miserable. To him, even a homeless person in the street looked more happy than him, and he couldn't stand that, so he stomped the homeless man to death. And clearly, Truck Kuhn didn't do a background search before deciding to isekai him because a moment later, Kaibara got run over and sent to this world. And now, he eats whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and he wants to get a taste of Matilda's supreme flavor. He sends his giant mouth to swallow her whole, but before he can get a bite, Sensei runs in front of her and says Kaibara's story is really boring. Kaibara tries to just eat Sensei as well, but for some reason, his instincts are preventing him from going any closer with his mouth, so he is starting to wonder who Sensei might really be. He is then cornered by Nira and Annette, and Annette declares that Sensei has the ability to banish otherworlders back to their original world. But I don't know why she thought it was a good idea to say all this out loud, but as she tells Sensei to use his ability and write Kaibara's story, Sensei says no, I don't think I will. He has standards for the stories he writes, and Kaibara's story is basically a privileged child complaining about how easy his life was. Hearing Sensei call his life story trash makes Kaibara furious, so he decides that before he eats Matilda, he is going to kill every last one of them here. Matilda blames herself for everything they had gone wrong so far. If she hadn't gotten in her father's way while he was fighting, then he never would have lost his arm, and if she had stopped Annette and the others from coming here, then they wouldn't be in danger right now. She doesn't know what to do, so she looks to Sensei for guidance, and he offers her a story which she has dedicated to her. The story is written based on Matilda's sad past, so as she opens the book, pages begin flying into the air. Annette didn't know Sensei's ability could also work on non-otherworlders, but she doesn't have time to focus on that since Kaibara is still attacking her. Sensei tells Matilda that he has learned a lot about her from her tragic story. She is so kind that she suppresses her own feelings for the sake of others, but she is still a clumsy woman, so as a child, she ended up bound by her father's vision of an ideal princess. After her mother and brother died, she attempted to raise Siberian spirits by replacing her brother who had been the ideal prince, but this only created more distance between her and her father. And at some point, she even lost sight of her true self altogether, but her mother once told her that her life belongs to her alone, so she should live for herself. Siberian ultimately just wants Matilda to be happy, so Sensei tells her that she has a choice to make. She can either live as the ideal princess like Siberian wanted, or replace her brother as the ideal prince. However, neither of those paths are who she truly wants to be. She has been the happiest throughout the time she has spent with Sensei and Annette, so Sensei says it is up to her to write the rest of her story. Golden light begins to shine all around Matilda and Siberian recognizes it as the sacred mark of the divine beast. This isn't the first time the mark has appeared, as when she was younger it showed up in her right hand, but while Leon was excited to tell Siberian about it since it means Matilda will become an incredibly strong fighter in the future, Matilda begged him not to tell their father about it because she knew Siberian didn't want her to have anything to do with martial arts. 
At the time, Siberian was nearby, so he heard the whole thing and saw as the mark faded from Matilda's hand because she didn't want to accept it for his sake. He now realizes that he was a fool to try and keep Matilda away from martial arts when she is so gifted at it. Kybera compliments Matilda for gaining some kind of power-up, but he has also finished digesting Siberian's hand, so he has completely mastered the lightning fist technique. Even flashbacks won't be enough to save her because it's not like she's in an anime with plot armor, so he will take pleasure in watching her despair as he eats her bit by bit. While Kaibara is ranting, Sensei lights up a smoke and calmly says that hope may often be disappointing, but even when pushed to the brink of despair, people will still always find the last thread of hope to cling onto. Matilda charges forward and Kaibara is still confident that he will overpower her, but then he gets discombobulated and headbutted into a concussion. He tries to counterattack. But Matilda has already charged up her finishing move, so even though he uses his rock-hard defenses, he is ultimately torn to shreds by the force of Matilda's attack. Kaibara falls to the ground, and now that he has been defeated, the sacred mark on Matilda's hand begins to fade as she falls unconscious. Siberian catches her and Anik comes over so she can heal her. While Matilda is being healed, Sensei goes up to Siberian and returns the Queen's diary to him. Siberian asks if Sensei read his deceased wife's diary without his permission, and Sensei doesn't deny it. But what's Siberian going to do? It's not like Sensei minds being sentenced to death for it. However, Siberian wouldn't dream of punishing Sensei because he owes him a debt of gratitude for giving his daughter guidance. Riard arrives a few moments later and he comments on how amazing it is that Matilda awakened her sacred mark, and not only that, but the move she used to defeat Kaibara is actually an ultimate technique known as King's Fang. Although, her version of it is still incomplete. Just then, Kaibara comes back to life as a monster. But this makes no sense since Siberian is sure Matilda's technique had killed him. Even Kaibara doesn't know how he managed to survive that, but then he thinks back to the time he and the other six heroes defeated the Dark Lord, and it all makes sense to him now. He had mentioned before that he was one of the heroes who killed the Dark Lord. But something he didn't mention was that while no one was looking, he had taken a piece of flesh from the Dark Lord and eaten it. At first he didn't know what kind of effect it would have on him, but now he can feel unimaginable power welling up inside him, so he has finally become the ultimate predator of this world. And with his new power, the first thing he is going to do is annihilate this entire kingdom. Or at least, that's what he would have done if he didn't get decapitated mid-sentence. The others are surprised to see Waldelia here along with her dragon, and Kaibara recognizes her as the Dark Lord's daughter, and he says he has something important to tell her. He starts talking about how much he enjoyed sticking her father's meat in his mouth, but Waldelia doesn't want to listen to another word from Kaibara's mouth, so she blasts him to ashes. Everyone is in awe of the power Waldelia possesses, and they are worried she may target them next, but then she hears a familiar voice that puts her on edge. Last time she saw Sensity, he has a hole in his chest. So she wonders how he could have possibly survived, however, Sensei doesn't answer her question and instead asks her if she feels any better after killing one of the people who killed her father. Waldelia doesn't know how to answer him, so she just threatens to kill Sensei the next time she sees him and flies away in her dragon. Nur is amazed that Sensei was able to scare off a woman as scary as Waldelia, but all Sensei can think about is how the look of sadness remained in Waldelia's eyes even after she had gotten revenge on one of the people who caused her father's death so he would love to write her story at some point in the future. The next day, operations have begun to repair the damage to the palace, although I don't know how they fixed a hole in a tree and Sensei, and the others are given a sincere thanks from Fawn on behalf of everyone at the royal capital. They are about to leave town, but Matilda isn't going to be coming with them since she decided to stay home and support her father. They'll miss her, but they can respect the decision she made. Meanwhile, Matilda is sitting in her room, but the king comes in and asks her what she's still doing here. Her friends already left to continue on their journey, and he wants her to go with them. Matilda tries saying she wants to stay and support him, but Siberian isn't weak enough to need the protection of a novice martial artist like her. Which is why he is encouraging her to go out on an adventure and gain some experience. But once her journey is over, she has to return home to him. Matilda understands what he is trying to say, so she changes into her adventuring clothes and jumps out the window. Before she goes, she thanks her father and promises to become a powerful martial artist, just like him by the time she returns. Down the road, Annette and Nir are pulling Sensei's coffin, but Sensei stops them and says that, unlike Annette, Nir has no talent for coffin pulling, so he isn't allowed to pull it alone. Nir tells Sensei to get out of the coffin and walk then since there's no way Anna can pull it alone, but it doesn't look like she will have to since Matilda comes running up behind them, and they are all happy to see each other again. 
Matilda leads the group to the largest tree in Zauberberg. Anna has been here before, but she still finds the tree to be magnificent no matter how many times she sees it. The World Tree is said to be a holy tree that watches over Zauberberg and grants protection to those who visit it. There's a small town called Tamerico nearby where the people live alongside nature. So Annette suggests that they stop there so they can pray for protection before continuing their journey. However, as they arrive instead of a quiet town, they find a whole ass casino in the middle of it. There has never been anything like this before, and people are already losing their life savings and getting their bananas stabbed in the parking lot. Actually, that's pretty realistic. Sensei says it's perfectly normal for people to ruin their lives when given the opportunity, so he doesn't really care about the casino. He is far more concerned about the fact that he is out of pills. He has been managing so far, but without his happy pill, he has a sudden urge to go swing off a tree by his neck. For now, Anna thinks they should go talk to the town mayor to find out what happened to this town, but first they need to stop Sensei from tweaking and eating pebbles. Once they find the mayor, he explains to them that several months ago, some otherworlders who came to see the World Tree decided to start living here, and they decided to build a casino to keep themselves entertained. But the casino attracted even more unsavory otherworlders, and now the village is a nothing more than a den for vices. It's even having effects on the environment as all the leaves of the World Tree have begun to wither and die. The World Tree has been growing weaker ever since the Otherworlders took over, so it must be a sign that the Tree Spirit is saddened by the events that have transpired. The Mayor pleads with them to help restore the village to what it once was, but as the quest box appears, someone speaks up from behind them and says he will help save the World Tree. He says his name is Yamada, and he is an Otherworlder, so the others are put on edge by his appearance. Yamada says he can understand why they would be wary of Otherworlders, but he assures them that he is different from all the other Otherworlders as he truly wants peace for this world. Matilda didn't realize there were Otherworlders who are actually nice, and Anna is happy to have all the assistance she can get, but as she calls over to Sensei so they can start going, she realizes that he has disappeared. Sensei has wandered into the middle of town, he is feeling better than ever, his back is straight and his mind and body are healthy, so he really needs to find some pills to put him back on the edge of death. As he is walking, he comes across a mysterious cave, and he gets a feeling this might be interesting, so he heads over, and to his surprise, he finds a bunch of idiots smoking the Zaza. Since he is elated to find such a den of unhealthy life choices, so he asks them to please pass him some weed because he really needs it. Just then, a woman comes out of nowhere and touches Sensei's face. She has never seen him around here before, and she doesn't want him falling victim to addiction. So she offers to take him to a place that is much more fun than this. She takes Sensei to a nearby bar, and she is amazed by how much he has been drinking since he got here. Sensei tells her that he is trying to drink himself into a coma. And the woman thinks Sensei is a really interesting person. She wonders what he was doing in that cave because that's where people who are addicted to the World Tree's pain-relieving leaves go. Sensei tells her that he lost something very important to him, so the thought of having a healthy body and mind is so horrifying that it keeps him up at night. The woman is even more intrigued by Sensei now, so she offers to do something to help him sleep comfortably. It's not what you're thinking, she says she is a dancer, so she offers to perform for Sensei to put his mind at ease. Sensei doesn't think a performance will make him feel better at all, but as the woman begins dancing, he looks like he's actually having fun. Meanwhile, Anna is crying her eyes out over the fact that she lost Sensei, but a few moments later, the door opens and Sensei is returned, although to Anna's horror, he is being carried by a strange woman. The mayor recognizes Eshi and asks her what she's doing here since she has been warned to stay away, but Eshi says she just wanted to drop Sensei off and immediately turns to leave after wishing Sensei a good night. Matilda asks who that woman was, so the mayor explains that her name is Esh, and she is known as the Witch of Tanariko. The name makes her sound really ominous, so the mayor goes on to explain that when the Otherworlders began building their casino on the edge of town, there was nothing the villagers could do to stop it even though they wanted to, but Eshi was different. She took the opportunity and sided with the Otherworlders so she could build a bar next to the casino. She was always a mysterious woman who lived on the edge of town and no one knows anything about her background or origins, but they left her alone since she was pretty much harmless. However, now that she has sided with the Otherworlders, she makes a fortune selling her wine and dancing for the Otherworlders, so the townspeople now see her as a traitorous witch. Since as she sided with the evil Otherworlders, Yamada believes she deserves to receive righteous punishment as well, and the mayor agrees with him. The next day, Sensei is heading back over to the casino part of town, and Anna tries to call him back because the attack on the Otherworlders they had planned would soon be starting. However, Sensei never agreed to be a part of such a dangerous plan, so instead, he wants to spend his time at Eshi's bar because he finds it comforting. Anna tries to go after him, but Yamada stops her and says it's no use because Sensei has already been charmed by Eshi, however, he assures Annette that Sensei will come back to her 
once they have destroyed the casino. Meanwhile, Sensei is having a nice drink with Eshian, and he thanks her for her show last night because it helped him get a good night's sleep for the first time in a long while. Eshi is glad to hear it, but she warns Sensei that he shouldn't hang around her too much because the people around here see her as a witch, but Sensei doesn't seem to mind because his life couldn't possibly get much worse. In that case, Eshi proposes a toast and hopes that the spirit of the world tree grants protection to Sensei's terrible life, but Sensei has never heard of the spirit of the world tree before. As she explains that there is a legend that when the spirit of the world tree descends upon the world, the wishes of the weak and sick will be answered. She jokes that Sensei might be saved from the pain of his life if he believes hard enough, but to Sensei, as she is the one who looks like she wants to be saved. As she is shocked by Sensei's words, but before she can give a clear answer, the bar doors swing open, and the other worlders in charge of the casino barge in. The boss orders Ashi to bring some drinks, so she gets up to serve them, and while she's doing that, one of the otherworlders threatens a bunch of adventurers who blew all their money on gambling and now owe the casino a ridiculous amount. The adventurers promise to pay the money back if they are given some time, but the otherworlder threatens them with his ability, and says they have to get the money by the end of the day even if they have to sell their kidneys to do it. The adventurers run out scared, so the otherworlder thinks they got the message, but he's still worried since the casino profits have been down lately. He suggests to his boss that it might be a good idea to move it somewhere else because all the suckers around here have already gone broke. However, the boss says there's no need to do something like that since he can just target the people from the village instead. Once he gets them addicted to the joys of a crippling gambling addiction and smoking till their lungs give out, they'll become repeat customers until they go broke or die of cancer. Either way, he doesn't care about the consequences. As she comes over with their drinks and reminds them that she made a deal with him and paid a lot of protection money, just so he would leave the townspeople alone. However, business is slow and the casino boss doesn't care how many people he has to turn into drug addicts as long as he makes his profit. He orders his subordinate to go kidnap some of the village people and get them high on shrooms until they become repeat customers. As she tries to stop him, but she ends up getting thrown into a bar stool. Sensei approaches her and comforts Eshi, telling her that her actions are not that of a witch. She is much more similar to an angel even if the townspeople don't recognize that. Just then, a huge crash is heard outside, so all the otherworlders run out to figure out what happened. But as they do, they see that the casino has been completely demolished. This is the work of Yamada, so as he sees the evil otherworlders, he prepares to exact his righteous justice upon them. The evil otherworlders are about to attack Yamada, but then Sensei walks up and says he hates flashy people like Yamada. Yamada tells Sensei to stay out of this since he doesn't have time to deal with someone who is charmed by the witch. Sensei actually does stay out of the matter. But it's not because Yamada told him to. Sensei has never once respected anyone who lectured him, and he's definitely not going to respect Yamada's sense of righteousness. Yamada decides to leave Sensei alone for now and deal with the evil otherworlders, so as they charge at him, he draws his sword and hits them with his justice slash which blows them all away. The otherworlders realize Yamada actually has way more power than they thought, so the boss orders everyone to make a tactical retreat. Now that the otherworlders have been taken care of, Yamada has to deal with Eshi because the villagers think she's evil as well. So he asks her if she still sides with the evil otherworlders. She tells him she is just glad that the town was finally saved, and that's good enough for him, so he says she's free to do whatever she wants from now on. The people of the town approach Yamada and cheer for him as their savior, but as soon as they notice Eshi, their cheers become hate-filled threats directed at her. Yamada tries to defuse the situation and tells everyone that Eshi isn't evil, so there's no need to take action against her if the townspeople still decide to throw stones at her to drive her away. Yamada is shocked by how cruel and unreasonable the people here are as they continue to hurl abuse at Esh. Sensei steps in and tells them all that they are worthless scum. How can they treat the person who has been protecting their town all this time like this? She has spent all of her time getting close to those otherworlders just so they wouldn't target the town, and if she hadn't done that, then the town would have been invaded long ago. If anyone is going to be considered the town's savior, then it should be Eshi, yet even knowing all this, ignorance prevails and the people still say they want to drive Eshi away. Eshi understands that she will never be accepted by the people of this village, so she tells Sensei he doesn't have to advocate for her because she is leaving. As she walks away, she apologizes for all the trouble she caused and the village people celebrate their success in getting rid of her. Yamada can't believe what he's seeing, so he asks Sensei if he knew things would end up like this. Sensei tells him that the line between good and evil is arbitrary, yet some people live their lives convinced that they are always on the righteous side. He can't say for sure whether Yamada was right to save the village, but he knows for sure that this village willingly kicked out the one who fought hardest to protect it, and he wouldn't want to spend another second around them. 
Sensei walks out of town along with all the others, and as they leave, the village mayor approaches Yamada and says he has a request for him. He tells Yamada that the otherworlders were selling the leaves of the world tree as drugs and getting people addicted to it. Yamada is disgusted to hear such a despicable act, but he is even more disgusted when he hears the village chief say he wants to start selling the leaf drugs as well. He saw the otherworlders making a ton of money from it, and he wants a piece of that pie as well, so he asks that Yamada become the town's bodyguard and debt collector. Yamada falls to his knees upon realizing that he wasted his time trying to save people who turned out to be scumbags in the end. As Sensei is being dragged away by the others, they see something that they never thought was possible. The world tree completely withers away, along with the village chief's plans to become a drug lord. Just then, a bright light appears before Sensei and he sees Eshi in her true form. It turns out that she was the spirit of the world tree all along and she thanks him for being the only one who was actually kind to her. She can't stay here much longer, so she leaves Sensei with a parting gift and provides a jar with infinite pills for him. The group's journey soon brings them to a desert, but the blazing heat is too much for them to bear. It's so hot that Nera has to take a break to hydrate the magic carpet. But Sensei seems to enjoy it since there's a chance he passes out from heatstroke. Matilda asks Annette if they really have to cross this whole desert, because there's still nothing but hot sand up ahead, and Annette isn't sure if they should keep going forward or not. She would like them to take the shortest path to the Dritten Temple which cuts through this desert, but with how things have gone so far, she doesn't think it's possible for them to make it all the way across the desert without dying from the heat. They are having a rough time, but now that they think about it, Mir seems to be doing perfectly fine despite the heat. Mir tells them that the heat doesn't bother him because he was actually raised in this area, so he knows how to navigate a desert easily. This is great news since Mir can now help them traverse this barren wasteland, and his first tip for surviving the desert is that it is actually safer to travel during the day despite the heat. At night, you are much more likely to run into monsters or bandits, so the day is a much better alternative, or at least it should have been, because they still end up getting attacked by bandits. The Jojo-looking ass bandit leader is an otherworlder named Toru, and he declares that this is his territory, so if the group wants to pass, they are going to need to pay a fee. This is the last thing Matilda wanted to have to deal with when it's already so hot, but since they are cornered, there's no choice. Anna tells Sensei to go hide inside the coffin, but with how hot it is, the inside of that coffin is basically an oven at this point, so she tells Sensei to just stay out here instead. Matilda and Annette begin fighting the bandits together, and with all the adventures they've been in so far, they are way too powerful for the bandits to handle, however, it looks like Sensei passed out from heat stroke, so Toru decides to go after the defenseless target instead. Nur is close to Sensei, so he stands to defend him from Toru, but he is still scared to draw his sword. Toru stops in front of Mir and mocks him for thinking he can protect others when it is obvious that he has never even held a sword before. He reminds Mir that wielding a sword means one is prepared to die and Toru isn't above killing children. He is totally fine with using his scorpion venom to give Nora a slow and painful death, so he asks if Nir really wants that. Nir may not want to die like that, but Sensei definitely does, so he starts inching up Toru's scorpion and asks to be given that excruciatingly painful death. Toru is freaked out by Sensei, but he assumes Sensei must think the poison is a bluff, so to prove that he's not bluffing, he stabs Sensei and injects him with tons of scorpion poison. A normal person would have started writhing in pain immediately, but in Sensei's case, after the scorpion stabs him, the scorpion dies instead. Sensei is disappointed by the fact that he's still alive, and Toru is devastated that his scorpion has been killed, so he charges towards Sensei and intends to make him pay. Nur is still too scared to draw his sword and fight, so he just stands there as Toru attempts to bash Sensei's head in. However, just before Toru could do it, they hear the sound of a beast howling and Toru's gang recognizes it as the Desert Wolf, so they need to get out of here quickly. Toru reluctantly decides to retreat, but he swears that he will avenge his scorpion. Now that things have settled down, Annette starts healing the hole in Sensei's chest, but even though they won the battle, Nur is feeling sad because he didn't have the courage to fight when his friend needed him the most. Matilda comes over and tries to cheer him up, saying it's not a big deal if he was too scared to act, he can just handle it the next time they get into a fight. Once Annette is fine healing Sensei, Nur apologizes for not being able to protect him. Nur blames himself for being a coward, but Sensei tells him that it's not his fault since no one ever starts out as a hero. People become stronger by facing their failures and moving forward in spite of them, so Nur shouldn't beat himself up too much over it. In any case, Annette is worried about the beast sound they heard earlier, so she doesn't want to stick around here long and asks Nur to lead the way. Nur feels better now that he has a way to make himself useful, so he leads the group to the home he grew up in. The place is called the Was Orphanage, and Nur says they can stay here for the night, 
But as he starts walking inside, he spots three familiar faces he hasn't seen in a while, and the kids are happy to have Nur back after such a long time. The woman who raised Mira Kathy comes out and welcomes him home, so the group is treated to a wonderful meal alongside the orphans. Mira is really excited to have some of Kathy's cooking, and the food today is especially delicious since a kind stranger has been donating a lot of ingredients to the orphanage lately. Kathy really wants to thank this person, but she has no idea who it is. One of the kids starts talking to Nir and reminds him that he said he wouldn't return to the orphanage until he had become a valiant hero. So they want to know if he did it. Matilda is watching Nir to see what he says after his fumble during their recent battle, and Mir knows he is no valiant hero. But he tells the kids that he's technically part of a hero's party, and he's technically not lying since Sensei counts as a hero from another world. Sensei denies being a hero of any kind and says he is just an author who writes stories, so the kids excitedly ask him to tell them a story. Sensei is fine with that and is about to begin his depressing story, but Kathy stops him since she doesn't want anyone traumatizing the kids before bedtime. Later on in the night, all the kids are asleep and Anna comments on how cute they all are, but all of a sudden, they hear the sound of the monster from before and it sounds pretty close. Kathy comes out and tells them that the sound is that of a wolf that has been terrorizing this area recently. The sound of its howling scares Kathy near death every night. And since she has to worry about the kids' safety, she locks the door and warns everyone that they need to stay inside at all costs if they want to survive the night. Meanwhile, Stensig is out on a leisurely night stroll, and he happens to come across the scene of a horrifying massacre. Now, horror movie instinct would tell me that it's time to turn around and act like I was never here, but Sensei thinks this might be interesting so he keeps going forward. Back at the orphanage, everyone has gone to sleep and it looks like they haven't realized that Sensei is missing yet. Matilda accidentally punches Nur in the face while she's asleep, waking him up and causing him to see a shadowy figure lurking outside the window. Nir remembers what Kathy had said about the wolf that prowls around this area so he is really scared but he also wants to protect everyone, so he grabs his sword and heads outside to check if there's anything out of place. As he does this, he ends up bumping into a man carrying a basket of vegetables and at first he thinks this guy is a thief, but the guy swears that he wasn't doing anything suspicious even if his actions definitely look suspicious. Nir realizes that this must be the person who has been secretly bringing food to the orphanage, but he asks why the man doesn't just deliver it directly since everyone would love to thank him personally. The man says he doesn't need to be thanked since he is satisfied just watching the happy faces on the kids as he spies on them through the windows. The man may be a little creepy, but his heart is in the right place so Nir asks him to come sit with him. The man asks why he hasn't seen Nir around the orphanage before today so Nir explains that he is currently traveling, but he grew up in this orphanage after his parents died when he was younger. The sword over there apparently belonged to Nir's father, so now he is dreaming of becoming a hero that is worthy of wielding that sword, so the others from the orphanage can be proud to have him as a big brother, although it's difficult for him to find the courage to actually do it. The man is moved tears by Nir's story and says Nir is a great kid, but Nir doesn't think there's anything great about himself. To cheer Nir up, the man asks if Nir could tell him some stories about his travels thus far and Nir is happy to oblige. All the while, Sensei has been standing in the corner and taking notes because he finds Nir's story to be quite interesting. Nir and the man talk through the night, and by the time the sun has risen, the man is getting ready to leave. Before he goes, Nir invites him in to have breakfast with everyone, since they'd all love to meet him. However, while the man appreciates the offer, supporting them from the shadows is more than enough for him. Besides, he doesn't think he deserves to be thanked in the first place. Nir can tell that the man seems a little upset, so he wants to do something to cheer him up and asks if the man has a little more free time to spend. Nir and the man head out into the desert and thanks the man's keen nose they are able to quickly track down an oasis. From here, they start gathering all sorts of crops together for the orphanage. Meanwhile, back at the orphanage, Sensei has had enough of the kids, so he slinks back into his coffin so they can't bother him. Annette and Matilda find this hilarious, but they then hear a sound outside and are shocked when they see all the food sitting on their doorstep. Later that day, Nur is exhausted from all the hard work he's been doing all morning, but he's also really happy he got all that food for the orphanage and spent time with the man. A little while later, Kathy comes running into the room with terrible news. Nur was expecting to hear about the mountain of food that was brought to the orphanage, but instead he is told that one of the kids has been kidnapped by Toru's gang. Toru is outside right now and he is threatening to seriously hurt Nate unless the owner of the orphanage comes out and pays him some money. Matilda can't believe Toru would be willing to hold the little kid hostage for ransom money, but she assures Kathy that she, Annette, and Nira will save him, so everyone else should just wait inside. They head outside and as soon as Toru recognizes the group, he orders all his men to attack, so Annette and Matilda immediately begin fighting, but they are struggling, so they could really use some help. 
However, Nur is frozen in fear again, so before he could become a target, the man from before shows up and pulls him away to safety. Nur is in tears over his cowardice because he knows Nate is in trouble, but his body won't allow him to do anything to help. The man starts having flashbacks to a time when he failed to protect his loved one, and he's not about to let the same thing happen to Nur, so he turns away from Mir and tells him that he will handle everything from here on out. He tells Mir that he is an otherworlder and back on Earth, he lost someone dear to him because he was weak, but here he finally has the power to protect what he cares about. The man transforms, revealing that he is the wolf that the locals have been scared of, and he wastes no time in attacking Toru and his gang. Once the gang realizes that the wolf is here, Toru drops the kit and starts fleeing, but the man isn't going to let Toru escape so easily. Scum like Toru stole everything from him, so with his powers, the man intends to finally get his revenge for a lifetime of suffering at the hands of evildoers. Nur realizes the amount of pain the man must have gone through, but if he actually kills Toru, the man will never be the same kind person he used to be, so Nur finally gathers the courage to draw his sword and steps in front of Toru to stop the man from killing him. Toru tries to take the opportunity to escape, but the man continues chasing after him and destroys his new scorpion bike. But before the man could deal a finishing blow, Nur stands in front of him again and drops his sword to appeal to the man's humanity. This is enough to snap him out of his bloodlusted rage, so the man returns to normal and is ashamed of how monstrous he was acting. Nur extends a hand to the man and tells the man that it's okay, so they all head into the orphanage, so they can hear the man's story. The man had lived alone for a long time because he lost his parents at an early age, but one day, a kind boy reached out to him and showed him the warmth of friendship. However, the happy days didn't last long as that boy was one day cornered by a bunch of bullies and beaten down. The man witnessed the whole thing, but he knew damn well that there was nothing he could do about it, so he turned tail and wheeled himself away. Which is when Truck Kum struck. Sensei's ability activates as he clarifies that although he thinks the man is a coward, the man is still much kinder than most people as even with the power of his gift, he still decided to use it just to scare off evildoers rather than succumbing to the power. It looks like he's going to be sent back to Earth, so the man tells everyone that he is glad he got to meet them all. Moments later, he vanishes and wakes up back on Earth right as Truck Kuhn began to leave, and as he looks up, he sees the kind boy coming to check on him. So he breaks down in tears because he's glad to see him. Back at the Demon Lord's castle, one of the seven evil heroes hears that Kainbaro was slain during his attempt to take over Grun, and that another one of them, Sengoku, is struggling in the desert against the Dwarven strongholds. They made the mistake of underestimating the Dwarves' allies from Hellscape, and he has to admit that the so-called Wizard of Hurricanes is truly formidable. We cut to the desert where the bloody battle of the dwarves is taking place and the priests are here to lend a hand, but Wolf is more concerned about the fact that he's out of booze. Isha asks him how he can drink at a time like this, but he sees nothing wrong with his actions and tells her to stop being so uptight all the time. Isha grabs him by the collar and reminds him that he is the one in charge of this nation, so he needs to act like it. Wolf corrects her and says that he never agreed to become the leader of this nation. The people here just decided to make him their leader even though he's just a priest, and now he's supposed to fight against a fallen hero. The fallen hero's army begins a full-scale attack, and Aisha asks Wolf to do something before the city gets destroyed, so Wolf complies and asks for the dwarf general Doran to help him lure the enemy to the east for a plan he has, but Doran says he has no intention of listening to Wolf and faces the army head-on with his axe. However, even though he said he wouldn't listen to Wolf, he still does lure the lizardmen towards the east, like Wolf had asked him to. Now that the lizard man have been lured away, Wolf tells Isha to stand back because he's going to have to get a little serious with his magic here. With the main enemy force isolated, he summons a magic circle beneath their feet and creates a massive hurricane, which shreds them to pieces. This forces the fallen hero to retreat with his remaining troops, and Wolf tells Isha that they've won the battle for today, but as he is walking away, Isha notices someone floating inside the hurricane, and it turns out to be Sensei. After everyone returned to the city, a party is held to celebrate their victory against the fallen hero and Donan has a seat of honor for his great contributions to the battle. Wolf also has a seat of honor and sits down before thanking all the dwarves for their hard work out there, especially Donan. And Donan admits that Wolf did a good job out there as well, even though he's an elf. They seem to have a good relationship with one another after all, so the party goes on, and in the background, they see Matilda and Mirror stuffing their faces with as much food as they can stomach while Aisha watches them with a smile. She wasn't expecting to run into Annette and the others anytime soon, so she's surprised that they happen to show up here. Annette confesses that her group got lost in the desert, and before they realized what had happened, Sensei suddenly got caught in a sand hurricane. Speaking of which, Isha asks how Sensei is doing, so Annette tells her that he is fine. Fortunately, he'd only suffered minor injuries because he was mostly inside his coffin, 
but Sensei doesn't think that was a fortunate thing at all since he ended up surviving because of it. On top of that, his precious coffin was completely destroyed too, but Annette promises to buy him a new one as soon as she can. Wolf then comes over to apologize to Sensei for accidentally hitting him with his hurricane and merely killing him, but Sensei is more angry that he couldn't finish the job. In other news, Wolf apparently has a familiar as well, and Marrow's is head over heels for it. Wolf asks Sensei to forgive his mistake since they are currently at war, however, Sensei and the others had no idea that a war was even taking place, so Aisha offers to explain the situation to them. This nation is currently being attacked by one of the seven fallen heroes, and as soon as Matilda hears about the fallen hero, she proudly exclaims that she was the one who defeated the fallen hero who attacked Grun. Wolf has a hard time believing that Matilda actually pulled so something like that off, and that ticks her off because she believes her party is pretty strong and shouldn't be underestimated. She tells Wolf that Sensei has the ability to send otherworlders back to where they came from, but Wolf isn't surprised since he already heard about it from the church meeting. And frankly, he doesn't think an ability like that is even needed, because no matter what ability an otherworlder possesses, he will always be able to outclass it with his magic. He doesn't want them interfering too much with his work, so he tells them to sit back and let him handle the fallen heroes. As he walks away, Matilda asks if Wolf is really strong enough for him to get away with being such a jerk, but unfortunately, Isha tells her Wolf actually is that powerful. He is known as the Wizard of Storms, and he is without a doubt one of the strongest mages in the entire world, so even the fallen heroes would have a hard time defending against his powerful magic. Back at the Demon Castle, the Dark Knight returns, and the others are surprised since they never thought he would be forced to retreat. He tells them that it's not a problem since tomorrow he will personally fight in the battle, and this time there's no way he could possibly lose. That's all well and good. But the other guy was actually thinking it would be better if they let the women handle this battle since they are much better suited for it. And as we get a look at one's hand, we see a rope around her hand, similar to the one Sensei has. Meaning this woman must be Saki. The other woman is busy making origami, so he asks her if she is ready to go and she blankly stares back at him in agreement. Back at the dwarf village, Sensei is taking a walk with Maros, and Maros is really depressed over the fact that he got rejected. So Sensei gives him a little advice and tells Maros that he should get used to the feeling of anguish, because it's not going away anytime soon. Still, Sensei can understand the feeling of wanting to be with the one you love, so he offers to help Maros find his crush. They are also going to think of a name for her, so Sensei suggests that they call Maros a crush Femelos, and by chance, they happen to find Femelos with Wolf, while he's being swarmed by a bunch of his fangirls. They all offer to take turns in bed with him, but Wolf turns them all down for today and walks away. Sensei remarks that Wolf seems to be really popular with the ladies, unlike Maros, but he encourages Maros not to give up on courting Femelos, because if he's persistent enough, eventually she will agree to go out with him. Sensei and Maros follow Wolf and Femelos until they arrive at an old house and Wolf knocks on the door. There's no answer, so Wolf accepts that the one inside doesn't want to talk to him right now, so he just tells her that he has to continue with the war, but once everything is over, he will come back for her. Sensei is surprised to see that a popular guy like Wolf still struggles with his own love story, but he doesn't want to intrude any further, so he leaves with Marrows soon after. The next day, Doran is informed that the enemy is attacking again, so it's time to go to war. Matilda gets up and says she will fight as well, but Doran tells her that there's no need since she and the others are guests here, so she should just let him handle it. Doran and Wolf head out to address the dwarf army, and they say that today is the day they finally end this war once and for all. The dwarves are all excited to head out and face the enemy forces, and things seem to be going really well at first, but all of a sudden, a dragon appears and blasts the entire area. This is the jade dragon that belonged to the Dark Lord, and now it's under the control of the Otherworlder, so Wolf feels bad for it, but a single dragon isn't going to make much of a difference to him. He has taken down tons of dragons in the past, and this one will be no different, however, as he is about to blast it, he locks eyes with a fallen hero who is riding it, and for some reason, he can't bring himself to cast his spell anymore. The girl gets off the dragon and greets Wolf as her former master, but before he can respond, she uses her power to capture him. Isha tries to help Wolf, but the girl uses her dark power to touch Aisha's hand, and for some reason, Isha feels a sudden surge of weakness and falls to the floor. The girl says she will be back to kill Isha later, but for now, she has business with Wolf, so she takes him and flies away on the dragon. Once Esha is able to get back to her feet, she yells down to Doron that they need to retreat immediately. After all the troops have retreated back to the castle, Isha tells them that Wolf was kidnapped, and Doron is doesn't know what to do since Wolf was the backbone of their army, so without him, the troops are in disarray and the castle walls will soon be breached. 
While everyone is trying to think of a way out of this mess, Sensei points out to Melos that Femelos is currently brokenhearted over the loss of her master, and this is a prime opportunity for Melos to use this heartbreak to score affection points with her. So they set off to rescue Wolf. In order to gain an understanding of Wolf's past, Sensei and Melos head back to that old house they saw him go to before. Sensei hopes to find out a little more about Wolf's past, so he walks up to the house and knocks on the door, saying he wants to ask the woman a few questions about Wolf. After a few moments, the door creaks open and an old lady steps out, so Sensei realizes that the story here might be more interesting than he thought. Wolf wakes up bound in front of the Dritten Temple and the girl, Yuriko, apparently has a lot of memories of this place since she practically grew up here. Upon realizing that there's an intruder, the guards of the temple rush out to stop Yuriko and rescue Wolf, however, with Yuriko's power, I doubt they will succeed. As Yuriko prepares to kill the guards, she thanks Wolf because it's all because of him that she was able to fully master her ability, so she wants him to stay out of her way so she doesn't have to kill him. Back at the dwarf castle, Isha tells everyone that it is likely that the girl was once Wolf's student, and Wolf used to be particularly passionate about training otherworlders, but one day he suddenly stopped and began drowning his sorrows away in alcohol. She doesn't know for sure if the cause of Wolf's behavior was because of the girl, but for now, their top priority is rescuing Wolf, so she needs Doran to send soldiers out to help in the rescue effort. Doran wishes he could help, but with the castle surrounded, he doesn't have any soldiers to spare at the moment. Since there are no other options, Matilda says she and the others can go rescue him instead. Anand agrees to this and turns to ask if Sensei is okay with it, but that's when she realizes that Sensei isn't here, and he's been gone for a while now too. Just then, Sensei walks into the room, and he's carrying the old lady, which raises a lot of questions and has Anna in tears because he has never carried her like that. By the next morning, the team is ready to depart for the Dritten Temple to rescue Wolf, and Doran apologizes for not being able to send any soldiers with them. But Matilda says it's alright since he made new equipment for all of them. However, Sensei says the equipment he ordered hasn't arrived yet, so he is not a satisfied customer. Doran tries to explain that what Sensei requested is very complex, so it's going to take a little longer to make, but Sensei doesn't care and just tells Doran to get it made. Isha interjects and says the group needs to get going since Wolf's life is still in danger. But even with that said, how are they going to get to the Dritten Temple all the way on the other side of the desert without exhausting themselves? Immediately after saying that, they hear someone talking from beneath the sand and it turns out to be Toru. Matilda thinks Toru is here to pick a fight with them again, but Toru assures her that he's not looking for any trouble. He turned his life around after Nurse saved him from getting mauled, so now he's a bus driver by day and protects the orphanage by night. Matilda and Mira have never heard of a bus before, so Toru decides to demonstrate using a randomly desert tiger that happened to be nearby. He uses his ability on it, which turns it into a tiger bus, and invites them all to get aboard. All except Sensei, because he is still holding a grudge over his favorite scorpion cycle that Sensei destroyed. He then leaves without Sensei and refuses to turn back to get him, so Sensei just accepts that he's not going to be doing anything useful this time around since he has no means of transportation. However, the old lady pleads with him to take her to Wolf, and Sensei can tell by the look in her eyes that she deeply cares for him, so he decides to give it his best shot after all. As the others arrive at the Dritten Temple, Anna finds some of the guards knocked out on the floor, so she tries to heal them, but Aisha stops her because there are still traces of magic on them, so Anna might be harmed if she tries touching them. They'll come back to take care of the injured later, but for now, they have to rescue Wolf. As they open the doors to the temple, they find Yuriko sitting in a chair with Wolf hanging above her. She introduces herself as the Otherworlder who was trained by Wolf, but now people call her the Fallen Angel of Greed, and she doesn't appreciate being interrupted while she was having an important moment with Wolf, so she uses her ability to summon several skeleton soldiers to take care of them. Nir and Toru run ahead to hold off the skeletons, and Wolf pleads with Yuriko to stop what she's doing, but she doesn't listen to him. Annette and Aisha work together to defeat a bunch of the skeletons, and Matilda is able to wipe out a large group of them, but it doesn't look like they will be getting a chance to rest anytime soon because the skeletons keep coming back to life. With immortal soldiers like these, the battle will go on until the group inevitably succumbs to exhaustion because that is what Yuriko wants. The group is starting to get overwhelmed, leading to Aisha getting knocked over from behind, and as she gets up, she questions Yuriko as to what could have happened between her and Wolf that would make her want to do all this. Isha knows better than anyone that Wolf is a passionate and skilled teacher, so she can't understand why Yuriko would hate him so much. Yuriko has a flashback to when she first arrived in this world. She was practicing with her ability out in the garden when Wolf walked up behind her. Wolf compliments her on her hard work, but he's worried that her ability might not be suited for combat, so he tells her that she isn't obligated to go to war against the Dark Lord if she doesn't want to. 
He would gladly welcome her so she can live a normal life in the church, but Yuriko remained insistent that she would join the fight because the people of this world need someone to save them. Wolf understood her convictions and said he would support her as much as she wants, but he asked her not to go overboard with her training. Yuriko admits that Wolf was an amazing teacher to her, and she enjoyed every minute of it, but then one day, another hero was summoned, and she was a natural prodigy, so Wolf became preoccupied with training her instead and stopped giving Yuriko as much attention. Yuriko continued training her powers, and when she finally made a breakthrough, she hurriedly ran to show Wolf in hopes that he would praise her like he used to, but when she finally found him, she saw Wolf praising the new girl, and he was being much more affectionate than he ever was with her. Seeing this made her feel abandoned and betrayed, so out of jealousy, she used her powers to murder the girl that stole Wolf's attention from her. That was the day her powers were truly unlocked, so she wouldn't be anywhere near as powerful as she is now if the events of that day never happened. Yuriko then proceeds to recall their skeletons and say that she is aware that it was wrong to kill an innocent girl because of her own feelings, but she has already committed a heinous act, so she has no right to call herself human anymore. All she wants now is for everyone to die, so she summons her most powerful creature, and is about to use it to slay all the people in the room. However, at the last second, Sensei crashes into the room on his new turbo engine coffin. This is what he asked the dwarves to build for him. And he's quite pleased with the results, but he has more pressing matters to attend to. Sensei then calls for Melos to bring the old lady, so Melos comes flying in on a magic carpet and brings the old lady face to face with Yuriko. Yuriko doesn't recognize her at first, but after a moment, she realizes that the old lady is actually her sister Ikari, and Sensei is really interested in hearing their story. The others are shocked to find out that Yuriko and the old lady are actually sisters, so Sensei explains that Ikari told him about her and Yuriko's childhood on the way here. They were really close family to each other from the start, but Ikari became sickly and needed constant care, so Yuriko volunteered to stay by her bedside and take care of her. Hikari recounts how Yuriko spent all her time taking care of her, so much so that she barely even went to school even though she really wanted to. When Sensei heard about this, he was touched by the level of kindness Yuriko had shown. So he had to come and get her side of the story as well, but Yuriko doesn't want to talk about it. So she summons more skeletons in an attempt to cut Sensei down. Sensei is usually not one to pass up a good chance to die, but he will leave the skeletons for the others to handle because he can't die until he has finished writing Yuriko and Hikari's story. Hikari tries talking Yuriko out of this because she knows this is not the kind of person Yuriko is, but in truth, Hikari knows nothing about Yuriko. And as a matter of fact, Yuriko reveals that she has always hated Hikari for stealing her social life from her. She was really happy when she finally arrived in this world because she thought she might actually have a chance to make friends and have a life here, but then Hikari showed up again and took everything from her. At that moment, she decided that she would never let Ikari get in her way again, so even if it means she is greedy, Yuriko will do whatever it takes to get what she wants. Sensei finds the story fascinating so far, so he walks closer to Yuriko and asks her to tell him exactly what it is she wants, however, Yuriko refuses to be patronized by Sensei, so she has her creature raise its scythe and prepare to strike Sensei down. However, just before Sensei got hit, Wolf jumped in and pushed Sensei out of the way, which led to him getting struck instead. The scythe didn't dismember his arm, but the nature of Yuriko's powers caused Wolf to begin aging rapidly, and Yuriko is frozen because she didn't mean to hurt Wolf. Wolf turns to her and apologizes because he had no idea that she felt so hurt by his actions back then, but Sensei cuts him off and asks Wolf to stay out of this. Sensei wants to write a story about the relationship between two sisters, not the relationship between the two sisters and a bishop, so he tells Wolf to just sit there while he writes his story. With that said, Sensei then turns to Yuriko and asks her once more what it is that she really wants. Yuriko tries to keep him away by summoning two skeleton soldiers, but even though they hit Sensei, it doesn't stop him in the slightest as he puts his hand on the wall and asks her what she wants one more time. The way Sensei is staring into her eyes gets Yuriko to calm down. So she takes a moment to really think about what it is that she wanted. She has a flashback to the opening ceremony of her high school, and all the girls were being brought to school by their fathers, but Yuriko wasn't able to go since she had to be by Hikari's side. She tried asking her father if he would go to the opening ceremony with her, but he was so preoccupied with making Hikari happy that he wasn't paying any attention to Yuriko. Yuriko gave up on trying to ask him to go with her, so as he left, Yuriko noticed that Hikari was asleep and since no one would notice if she were gone, she decided to go to her opening ceremony anyway, even if she had to go by herself. She had intended to just be gone for a few hours and return before anyone would notice, but by the time she got back to the hospital, she saw the lights on in Hikari's room, so something bad must have happened. She runs up to the room and finds her father as he is thanking the doctor for his help, 
And as soon as her father spots her, the first thing he does is walk over and smack the shit out of her for leaving Hikari alone, just so she could have fun. In his defense, Hikari could have easily died because she was left alone, but he takes an L for how he handled the situation as a parent. In that moment, Yurikaba felt like she didn't matter to him anymore, so she just left and started walking into the night. And that was when Truck Kun decided she was a good target. All she wanted was for someone to pay attention to her, but her desire led to her almost killing Hikari. She doesn't think she deserves to be called a caring sister after what she has done, and yeah, she may have done some really bad things, but her desire to be paid attention to doesn't make her greedy because everyone in the world wants to be seen in one way or the other. Yuriko is just a kind girl who is a bit awkward, even if she has a massive kill count. Just then, Hikari hugs Yuriko and begins apologizing to her because she hadn't realized how much Yuriko suffered because of her. Sensei asks Yuriko if she knows how Hikari got summoned to this world in the first place and she doesn't, so he tells her that after Hikari woke up, day after day passed without her hearing from Yuriko, and she slowly began to lose hope because she couldn't imagine a life without Yuriko with her. So one night she began walking aimlessly along the street, and that's when Truck Kuma decided to come back for round two. Yuriko begins crying because she hadn't realized how much Hikari cared for her, and Wolf now realizes that he failed as a teacher. When Hikari first arrived in this world, he was giving her the usual greeting he would give any other worlder. But then Yuriko recognized Hikari and ran over to hug her since she was happy to see her again. She asked how Hikari was feeling, and it turns out terminal illness doesn't get Izakaid with you. So if Hikari was perfectly fine in this world. A little while after that, Hikari went to talk privately with Wolf and asked him to train her extra hard so she could become strong enough to defeat the Dark Lord. Hikari wanted to be able to fight alone so that Yuriko could live a normal life in this world. She knew that Yuriko had to take care of her because of her illness, and that stopped her from enjoying her life back on Earth, so Hikari wanted to repay Yuriko by taking on all the responsibilities as a hero here so Yuriko could finally enjoy herself and be happy. It turns out that the two of them have always loved each other, and Sensei is satisfied with the story he has written about them. So his ability activates and both Yuriko and Hikari are surrounded by his blue light. As much as Sensei wants to see the story's conclusion, he also believes a story like this needs to be completed by the people involved. So he hears out the page, and as he does so, the dark power within Yuriko is dispelled and Hikari's youth is restored to her, along with the life of all the other people she nearly killed. Yuriko doesn't understand what's going on, so Isha explains that Sensei's ability is about to send her back to her original world, and Yuriko is perfectly fine with that. So she stands up and apologizes to everyone for all the trouble she caused. She then turns to Wolf and thanks him for giving her the chance to enjoy her life, even if it was only a short time. And after that, she and Hikari hold hands as they walk into the portal which sends them back to Earth. Back on Earth, unfortunately. Hikari's chronic illness is back, but Yuriko is by her side again, and neither of them really recall what happened in the other world, but their bond as sisters is stronger than ever. While all that was going on, the dwarves had successfully managed to fend off the invading army, but they can't call it a victory yet unless Wolf and the others are able to return. The Pope receives a report that an otherworlder has been sent away from this world, and he believes it must have been the work of Sensei's ability, so he is truly glad since this means Sensei will become the true savior of this world. Now that everything is taken care of, Wolf thanks everyone for their help and says they should start heading back to the dwarf castle. But Matilda mocks him for giving orders when he did absolutely nothing during the whole fight. While Matilda continues to make fun of Wolf, Sensei notices that something is wrong and before long another opponent comes crashing down through the ceiling. It is revealed to be the fallen angel of misery and he is kind of annoyed with how both gluttony and greed have been taken out by this group so he intends to finish the party off with his own hands. The group gets ready for a fight but Wolf is actually grateful to misery since after the last fight where he was completely useless. Wolf was hoping for a chance to show off a little. He begins casting his wind spell at max output, and it causes a whirlwind of epic proportions. Normally, anyone caught in it would have been shredded to pieces, but Misery is completely unharmed because his armor negates all magic. Since Wolf's attack wasn't effective, Toru sneaks up behind Misery and tries to use his ability to turn him into a bike, but Misery's armor once again shields him from the effects, and Toru is knocked away because of it. Since magic hasn't worked so far, Matilda tries using a physical attack to take down Misery, however, as she strikes Misery, her punch is stopped instantly. Misery compliments her on her skills, but he says she still lacks the combat experience necessary to defeat him. He thinks it's a shame to kill such a talented person, but he has no choice, so he stretches his hand out and summons a sword so he can cut her down. However, just before she gets hit, Nurse steps in the way to block it, and to everyone's surprise, Misery's sword shatters as a result. 
Misery can't believe what just happened, but he soon recognizes the sword Nur is holding and smiles a little. He then tells Nur that he should spend more time honing his skills and turns to fly away, leaving Nur confused as to what just happened. While he's still trying to figure out what happened, Matilda jumps on him and begins thanking Nur for saving her. The rest of the group comes over to congratulate him on successfully scaring off a fallen angel, but Nur still isn't sure how he did it. In any case, today counts as an outstanding victory against the fallen angels, so by the time they return to the castle, they have a party with the dwarves to celebrate. While the festivities are going on, Isha tells Wolf that she's glad that the Otherworlder and her sister got to have a happy ending, but Wolf doesn't think that's really the case. Sure, they may have been unhappy in their original world, but if anything, they were even more unhappy in this world. They were summoned here by a minimum wage truck against their will and told to become heroes for this world's convenience, so Wolf is starting to question whether the church might be in the wrong here. Later that night, Sakin is walking through the battlefield and straight up to the castle, while inside, Sensei is trying to give Melos a pep talk so he can go talk to Femelos again. Melos gives it his best shot, but he is immediately rejected again, so it's back to the drawing board for Sensei's matchmaking plans. Sensei tells Melos that he might just be destined to be alone forever, and Melos doesn't take kindly to that comment, so he starts chewing on Sensei's head a lot. But as Sensei is walking down the hallway, a very familiar figure walks past him and he stops himself dead in his tracks. He turns around just to make sure he isn't seeing things, and sure enough, the person standing there is none other than his section. She turns around and says she is happy to see him again, and Sensei has so much he wants to tell her, but before any of that, he grabs hold of her hand and says he wants to fulfill the promise they made to one another. Surely, if they fall from this height, then there's no way they could survive, so Sensei is ready to jump, but Sakin pulls her hand back. She can tell by looking at him that Sensei has changed a lot since he arrived in this world, and most notably, there's light in his eyes now, so Sakin knows he isn't the same depressed man she once knew. Sensei tries to explain that he is still every bit as sad and pathetic as he was the last time she saw him, but then his friends show up, and this pretty much proves Sakin's point. Sensei has found something worth living for, so she won't allow him to throw his life away with her anymore. Sensei tries telling Sekshin to wait, and upon hearing him say her name, Annette realizes that the girl is the one Sensei has been looking for, but she has already disappeared without a trace. The next morning, the group heads down to the blacksmith to thank him for all the equipment he made for them. But when Anna tells Sensei to thank the blacksmith as well, she sees that he is still in a state of panic over his encounter with Sakshin last night, and he desperately wants to find her again so he can prove to her that he still wants to die just as bad as he used to. And while all that is going on, Nur asks the blacksmith if he can take a look at his sword. The sword apparently belonged to his father, and it was able to shatter a fallen angel's sword even though Nur isn't particularly strong, so he was wondering if there is anything special about it. The blacksmith takes one look at it, and you can see just how amazing the sword is, so he tells Nir that he isn't worthy of wielding such a sword, but he only says this to encourage Nir to become someone who can wield the sword to its full capacity. Just then, Sensei powers up his coffin car, and the blacksmith warns him that the coffin is still not properly tested, so if he isn't careful in that thing, it might end up killing him. But that is exactly what Sensei is hoping for. He rides out of there and begins driving to who knows where, so the others chase after him to make sure he doesn't hurt himself out there. But before leaving, Nur turns back to thank Toru for all his help. Meanwhile, back at the Dark Lord's castle, Sloth notices that Misery seems to be a lot happier than usual, and just then, Sakin returns to the group, and she seems to be in a good mood as well. The remaining fallen angels all take a seat so they can get their meeting started, and the first thing Sloth wants to address is that they are already down to five members after the last two got defeated. Sloth says they are all useless, but Sakin tells him he has no right to say that when all he ever does is stay holed up in this castle so he can watch the world. Sloth admits that she's right about that, and on another note, he asks how Sakin's reunion with her beloved Sensei went. Sakin tells him it was great, and that Sensei is still as wonderful as she remembers him to be, which is why he is the only one that is worthy of her. Meanwhile, Sensei is officially missing since the group weren't able to catch up to him in his coffin car, and on top of that, they are lost as well, so Nir and Annette are trying to figure out where they are. Just then, a man approaches them and asks if they are lost. He tells them that the village they are currently in is called Held, and it is known for being the hero's final stop before he went to fight the Dark Lord. There's even a statue of the hero fighting the Dark Lord, but it honestly looks more like the hero was running away from the Dark Lord. The man knows what it looks like, but he assures them that it wasn't always like this. 
used to show the hero valiantly racing the Dark Lord, but a couple of minutes ago, a sad man in a coffin came speeding down the street and crashed into it. The group realizes that the man may be talking about Sensei, so they want to hurry after him, but the man tells him that there's no need since he went down the shrine tunnel, and that tunnel only leads to the forbidden land of Orange where the Fairy of Queen lives. Matilda is starting to get worried that Sensei will get himself into some serious trouble, but the man tells them they don't need to worry since no one can make it to the forbidden land unless they pass the trials of the tunnel, and what are the chances that he passes the trials accidentally? As Sensei is riding down the tunnel, a voice calls out to him and warns him that he will not be able to pass the trials that are up ahead, so for his own good, he had better turn back now. But Sensei just ignores the voice and closes the coffin door because being told what to do. The first trial is a test of strength, and normally a candidate would have to defeat this huge monster to pass through, but Sensei's coffin car easily takes out the monster's ankles and keeps going. The next trial is one of intelligence, but before the guard can even explain what the rules are, Sensei's coffin car breaks his ankles as well. There's also the test of spirit, but predictably, ankles were once again broken. Those three trials are meant to be practically impossible to complete, and to this day, the only one known to have successfully made it through is the hero. The man thinks Sensei will return soon enough since there's no way he could beat all those trials, but with the crazy things Anna has seen Sensei do, she is worried about what will happen if he really does pass all those tests. Although the others don't seem so worried, after Sensei has made it past all the tests, he is teleported to the Fairy Queen and finds himself lying on her chest. He sits up and asks if he finally died and crossed over to the other side, but to his disappointment, two fairies show up and tell him that he is in Orange, a land of the Fairy Queen. One also tells him to quit sitting on the Fairy Queen's O Pie, but Sensei ignores that last part and stays where he is. The Fairy Queen doesn't seem to mind and introduces herself as Oberus. She tells Sensei that she grants her protection to those who make it here, so they can restore peace to the world, and it is his duty to fulfill that wish. Before she grants him the protection, she has one question to ask him, so she asks what he thinks it takes to save the world. Is it trust in your friends or absolute power? However, Sensei chooses the third option and says the one he trusted most left him, so he really doesn't want to live in this world anymore. The fairies yell at him to pick one of the real options, but Sensei is sticking by his answer. He sees no reason to care about world peace now that Sakin doesn't want to be with him, so the world can burn for all he cares. The fairies start thinking it might have been a mistake for Sensei to end up here since he doesn't have the qualities of a hero that they need, however, Oberus thinks there's more to him than meets the eye since she senses the protection of Eshi on him. The other fairies are surprised to hear this because Eshi is the spirit of the world tree, and she is known to be incredibly earnest and sincere, so she must have had a good reason to grant Sensei her blessing. Oberus asks Sensei what blessing Eshi granted him, so Sensei explains that he got a bottle of infinite pills from her, and he even offers to share some with Oberus, but the other fairies are enraged that Sensei would scatter drugs on the fairy queen's chest, so they threaten to kill him, although Sensei is more than happy to get stabbed. Oberus stops the two and reminds them that a man known as a hero once came to this place and received her blessing, yet he ultimately failed to bring peace to the world, and now the world is more chaotic than it has ever been. The elves in the north observe the world and call themselves the Helshen, while seven fallen humans have defeated the ruler of Dragonkind and a bunch of other worlders have been thrown into the mix. There's nothing a righteous person can do to fix things at this point, so someone like Sensei coming to this land couldn't possibly be a mistake. She decides to give Sensei her blessing after all, so she touches the Sensei's wrist rope and tells him that by the time his journey is over, he will be reunited with his soulmate. She can't ask him to save the world for her, but she just wants Sensei to continue living a little while longer because the world will eventually work things out. Sensei feels a little hope after hearing that he will reunite with Sakshin, so he thanks Oberus for her help and says she is a very kind woman. Oberus appreciates the compliment and as a parting gift, she presents Sensei with a fairy whistle and tells him that he can blow on it at any time, and that he will be granted the full strength of the fairies to support him. After that, she teleports him away and back in the town, the others are still waiting for Sensei to get back. Nerf thinks there's a bigger issue though, since even if Sensei returns, will he continue traveling with them now that he knows that Sakshin rejected him? Anna refuses to believe that her journey with Sensei will end since she cares deeply for him. But before she can finish her sentence, Sensei falls out of the sky and crashes into the statue again. The man from the town starts yelling at him to fix what he's done, but Sensei doesn't want to deal with it himself, so he blows on his fairy whistle and summons Solu the fairy to do it instead. She doesn't want to do it at first, but the fairy queen tells her she has no choice, so she grabs a rope and starts pulling. 
The group leaves the town, and it remains uncertain whether Sensei is meant to bring peace to the world, or to plunge it further into chaos. But for now, he is going to continue his journey if it brings him closer to reuniting with his soulmate. This was the final episode. Subscribe for more anime recaps.